This is unusual. I'm so confused. Okay. <laughs> I am so confused. <laughs> Let's see here. Um. Okay, hold on. Let's get this out here. Um. <clears throat> Firstly, I don't want to look at that anymore. <laughs> Hold on. Let's see here. All right. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Okay. Hello, anyone and everyone. Mandry! <laughs> the Twitch protection program. You are. Everybody's safe here. Good to see you, Mandry. How are you? Um, I gotta get my bearing a little bit. It's a little bit strange. Not gonna lie. I think everything should be fine. Sound-wise. And all that jazz. But it's good to see you, Mandry. <clears throat> I, uh... Still trying to get... Let's try some, like, commands. What do you mean, sign into chat? What are you talking about, sign into chat? This is my dang account. Um, That's it, right? Ooh, what is that password? This is funny. Let's see here. Oh. Correct. Hold on, I gotta look at this really quickly. Never done this before, so you gotta give me just a second. Did that work? Did that work? Did that work? Oh, ooh, work? why do I see that? Oh, I hate it. Um, <laughs> wow, I hate that. Okay, we're gonna get rid of that. <laughs> okay, hold on. Oh boy, let's see here. Healthy and clean cut, yes. I am feeling much healthier. I am feeling much healthier. Um, <laughs> let's see. How does this even work? Oh my gosh, I'm so confused. Uh, we got that, and we gotta do this and bring it up here. Okay, we're getting there. We're getting there. I guess I'm just gonna have to pop out chat and use it kind of like normal. But that's all good. It's good to see you too, Mandry. Okay, let's try some bot commands here. How'd that work? No, of course that's not gonna work. What a silly thing to try. Did that work? I don't think it worked. Okay, it says stream elements bot is running. Let's try. What do you mean no quote found? Oh, maybe I have to add quotes. <laughs> I see. Has a cap a face? Okay, so supposedly BTT, BTTV stuff works. But I don't know how to, I don't know how to enable it either. Dashboard connections. <gasps> Wait, YouTube. <gasps> what do you mean coming very soon? Why does it say coming very soon? It's supposed to be here. Hey, it's supposed to be here. It says coming soon. Okay, so apparently they don't have it for YouTube yet, but it will come here soon. This one's called Elbow Cough. <laughs> not dab. It's definitely not a dab. It's definitely an elbow cough. <laughs> Jax! Okay, Jax, I need to get your email. I'll make you uh, I'll make you a mod. But I need your emails. That's all I need. So you can send me that in Discord. <clears throat> you got BTT update for... Yeah, I don't know how to make it a thing, though. How do you make it a thing, I guess? Looking at Twitch sending a chat. Right. That's for Twitch. Now I want to do YouTube. And I can't. I don't know why. It says it's on. I don't know. I don't know how to do it. I'm very confused. Okay. Anyways. I don't know. But I guess we'll figure it out. Oh, look at that. And I have that set up. Wait, wait. Does the dab thing show up in chat? Wait, how do we do this? Um, I guess let me just try some things. Does that stuff show up or no? No, but the thumb does. Does the little dabby dude show up? No, the little dabby dude does not show up. 
Weird. Oh, and I also like how if you look at the chat bot over on here, it doesn't show up as pictures. <laughs> it doesn't show up in the screen though. You gotta do like, you gotta do like, um, let's see, like these. They'll show up. Wait for it. Let's see if it works. I don't know if it'll work or not. I don't know. I connected Stream Elements, and now it seems to be uh, Stream Elements is doing well. But it's still, it's still, it's being a little bit strange. Like, oh yeah, there they go. See, they show up on the on the screen, like that. Nifty. Thank you, Phoebe. I appreciate that. Yeah, we got one K subs. It took us a while. It took us a while. I don't know. The horses didn't show up. That's a bummer. <laughs> Leave it to Mandrew. They always be horsing around. Hey, they have a pony. Oh, it's true. <laughs> it's a pony. Um, but no, it took us a while, but I'm glad we got to a thousand subs. So we're having a little bit of celebratory stream <laughs> on sub. No. <laughs> Oh man, I gotta bring over the emotes. I don't know how to get emotes on here. Um, I know some YouTube streamers have emotes, but I don't know if it's like they, they've been doing it for a while or not. Um, I don't know, but there seems to be like a ton of, 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 of options to do emotes on this here YouTube thing. So well, it's kind of interesting. How is everybody? How's everybody been? It's been a very, very chaotic in my life and we're gonna talk about it a little bit, I think. Um, and I want to tell you what I'm researching now, where I've been at with research. Uh, <clears throat> and the last time we talked, I think I just finished lecturing. Is that right? Did I just finish lecturing? Or was I about to finish lecturing? I don't remember. I think I just finished lecturing. It was like the Wednesday after. And then um, things went all downhill after that. <laughs> yes, it was, a, it was a very hectic month. Um... Yes, but it's okay. It's okay. It's been good. I've been, I've been, I've been learning a lot about myself and about, about everything. Um, so let's just get into that, I guess. So if you guys, um, I'm from Binghamton University. Amrit. Uh, Amrit. Is it Amrit? Amrit? I'm from Binghamton University. So if you guys have been following on Discord, I had another bout with the old stomach issues um, that landed me in the hospital. This time it looked a little bit more severe than last time. So I um, I had to change some stuff about my uh, about my life, I guess I should say. Um, <clears throat> alien, yes, it was like alien, it like bleh, came out of my stomach. Um, although it was a space balls alien. So we started dancing and then everybody was like excited. Um, <laughs> but anyways, uh, no, I'll be, so I, I had to change some stuff in my life and it's taking a while to get used to. So it's that's all. That's why that's why streaming is not uh, not a regular thing again yet. Um, but of course it will be. It'll be it'll be coming back. Um, and if you're on YouTube and you're not over following me over on Twitch, then you should do that because that's where I stream normally. And once I come back, it will be. Uh, I don't know exactly how the schedule is gonna go. I think I'm gonna do um, one. I would like to do if when I come back, whatever shape it is. I, I think I'd like to do one YouTube stream a month. And then do the rest over on Twitch, but I don't know exactly what that's going to look like yet. Um, the uh, treatment options for like dealing with my health issues are uh, are going to like kind of change some some pretty major things. And there's like a lot of stuff I just have to focus on, right? Like I'm 34, and I need to focus on my health. I need to get my PhD done. I mean, that's just a thing. I need to focus on that and start getting some. I need to start getting some like. Uh, you know, some very focused direction with that. Uh, so that's going to be a focus for me for this for this year is uh, is working on that. Uh, I had definitely have some ideas of th some things that I'm going to be focusing on heavily. That is like the culmination of all my stuff. Lately, I've been working on quantum complexity theory, which I've been liking a lot and is wild. Um, I thought it was going to be like this small little thing small little field but not even remotely close to small <laughs> or little it's an enormous field with tons of work done in it um so we're going to talk about that and see some of the most uh some of the more i guess prominent problems in it and uh and talk about how it's helpful to like anybody who's interested in quantum computing because it shows up everywhere in quantum computing so we're going to talk about quantum complexity theory today and that's kind of where i've been thinking a lot about but you guys know that i started in particle physics and now i'm finding more and more stuff um, 
more and more interesting uh <clears throat> more and more interesting material that relates the two so uh, that's kind of where i want to go with my you know with my phd is is to a very new field of like quantum field theory and, and qu quantum complexity theory and it's very very complicated <laughs> but it's where i've been putting a lot of work for the past couple years and that's where i want to focus on moving forward um but hello there. Uh, let's call. Let's try. Your name is hard to pronounce. We're gonna say Doctor Um. How are you? Uh, good to see you, everybody. It's good to see everybody. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm just gonna field some questions. Last stream, I went. <laughs> Last stream, I went really heavy into uh, planning things to do with you all, and we didn't get a time to just sort of hang out and chill. So now is our hangout and chill time. So. Feel free to ask any questions because I would, I'm, I'm, I'd love to answer any questions you guys have, whether it be about physics or about where I've been or how I am or anything like that, or what I'm focusing on right now. Um, then that is fine. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not seeing all of the messages, and I don't know why. Just call you doctor. Oh, are you the doctor from Twitch? Because I remember that. I remember that name. Um, doctor with the K from Twitch. I remember that name. Um, I have a question for you. Who are you and what do you do? Well, my name is Eric and I study particle physics. That's you. I knew it. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I study, I study particle physics and quantum information theory. Um, that's where I'm studying right now. Uh, so it looks like Noah has a question, but for some reason it didn't show up in my chat, which is really strange. Um, hopefully I'll be able to watch semi regularly this semester. I'm taking real analysis and numerical analysis and they are already kicking my ass yeah so feel free to ask me questions like that because i like real analysis and i if i don't know the answer we can pass it on to like boring math professor or someone like that but ask in discord um but it's good to see you cosmic gaussian it's good to see you as well is uh bachelor in technology is good or a bachelor in science is good for research in pure science um in pure science i would definitely go with the bachelors in that science um so usually what you do is you want to pick a major to study um, and I know it works differently with some other places, like in England, they have a very different setup than the United States, where if you pick a uh, focus, that is all that you study. And in the States, you take like a lot of elective classes and things like that. Um, I'm not sure how it works in India or the places that I get a lot of viewership from. Um, but in, uh, but yeah, so basically you pick a, a topic that you want to study, whether it's physics or biology, and you kind of, you get a degree focused in that. Myself, I got a degree in physics, but I also had a specialty degree. I had a, uh, mathematical physics degree, which basically meant I could skip my labs and focus on theory and math classes. So I did like real analysis and uh, what else did I do? Probability and random variables and things like that. That would be more of, uh, more beneficial to myself. But really your degree is going to kind of be like your focus of everything that you're doing when you're, when you're researching. So like everything that you're gonna need for research, you're gonna start to learn that in your classes. You're gonna start to like pick up on some of the, the words, the lingo. And then again, the big thing is the processes. You need to learn how to do these things. So like, for instance, if you've never taken um, a quantum mechanics class, you're not going to know how to take the inner products of states, right? That's like gonna be very difficult for you to do if you've never actually seen it in class. After you see it in class a few times, you do it in your homework, you do it with your friends, You then you pick up a, a article and you realize that you weren't really paying too much attention in class and you have to try it again and learn how to do it again. So you go back to your textbook and you relearn it and then you do it again and then soon enough you can start to do it like consistently and easily. Um, but yeah, that's the that's the goal. The goal is to have a you know a degree and then that focuses on what you want to study because then you're going to be looking at that stuff very thoroughly throughout that degree and then when you actually go to research something you'll have that background that you need to start the research and then the research is really going to be where you start to concrete put that knowledge into your brain concretely um yeah uh <clears throat> do part of, i have a haircut Tyrion. my hair is fine right now my hair's fine, Tyrion. <laughs> I got a haircut like a month ago. It's fine. I got two more months easily out of this haircut. Um, can you explain in short about quantum information theory? I can. So quantum information theory is uh, is basically how good um, or how interest or like let's see how effective 
you can get information from one side of a computation to another side of a computation. So, for instance, quantum information is like, uh, you know, so I guess like it's a weird, quantum information is definitely a weird thing because it gets spread out over a bunch of states usually in the middle of the computation process. And then, so basically you set up a, a bunch of qubits into an initial state and then you apply a bunch of quantum operators to them known as quantum gates. They're very specific operators usually done for a purpose, like a computational purpose. And that information that is, that exists on those original states gets spread out. Okay, so this is just kind of showing you some of the different aspects between quantum computing and classical computing. So the information that's on that's in those states gets spread out amongst a bunch of superpositions of states, right? And then at the end you take a measurement, a single measurement, and that will collapse the wave function into a single classical bit again. Now, the beginning is a bunch of classical bits, and the end is a bunch of classical bits. But in the middle, you're doing a bunch of quantum processes. Right? So that information will change, but it doesn't change classically, it changes quantumly. So the idea behind quantum information theory is trying to track how that information is going to change as it goes through these processes. Um, and that's, yes, yeah, so that's what we do in quantum information theory. So there's a lot of work to be done. There's like a very, you know, a field maybe, I don't even know how old it is. 25 years old maybe is uh, relativistic quantum information. Um, I don't know. I know there's a lot of survey papers from the early 2000s, but I don't know how long it's been around exactly. Um, but then quantum information theory has been around pretty much since information theory in general was around. So like, um, you know, like uh, information, like Shannon's entropy and Shannon's information theories and stuff like that. That's sort of when people started thinking about information theory and then quantum information theory came shortly after that. And these questions about how a, you know, how quantum processes can transport information from one system to another system, noticing that every time we take a measurement, we get classical information, right? I mean, like that's a, like that's a, that's a, a, uh, a, uh, you know, one of the defining factors with quantum mechanics is once you measure something, you come up with classical information. Uh, so that's kind of like the cool thing about quantum information theory is, is we have to follow we have to follow the information as it progresses through the computer and pre and pre um what's the words like some of the other big things are like um preserving the information you know uh every time there's interactions with the system you'll start to lose information out of the system because the states will start to collapse um and you'll lose information so it, it, quantum information theory is the theoretical this is the theoretical side of this like trying to get information through a quantum computer um and then of course there's the other side which is like the materials the engineering the building and all of that has to be done by like you know really highly talented experimentalists like people like olivia lanes that we had on here um yeah uh i guess there's more of a craze for tech field rather than in pure science had pure science lost its importance no not at all um I mean, there's always going to be a craze for tech. There always has been, there always will be. And I think that we get to a certain age where we stop kind of like fancy, uh, what's it called? Um, I don't wanna say fantasizing, um, but we sort of like are able to pay attention more to what the economy values. And the economy will always value tech because it's always going to you know, give back to the economy. So like there's going to be an obvious an obvious craze towards technology over just information or knowledge because the technology is what's going to be, you know, giving back to the economy. So of course the economy and the technology are going to be going hand in hand. And I think we get to a certain age where we start paying attention to that. That's just sort of how I saw it. Um, so yeah, so tech will always have that. It always has and always will have that. Um, but then we like talk about history and we talk about like Wheeler and Einstein and Feynman and um <clears throat> oh geez yang <laughs> cn yang we talk about all these like brilliant physicists from the past gelman uh pice we talk about all of them and then like we realize that like we're talking about their pursuits of knowledge but we're also kind of like ignoring the fact that there was you know these giant computers at the time that were doing calculations that we you know can do on our phone now or we can do you know with uh you know a handheld calculator or anything like that but that was what the tech craze was at the time was how do we build these computers and it was uh it was wild um what advice okay let's see 
They can't afford a razor. I <laughs> they can't afford a haircut. I sh I'll have you know, I shaved this this morning. I've been shaving regularly. How about that, Tyrion? Um, and Mandry. You do need a haircut, Richard Feynman. <laughs> what advice would you give uh, a student entering undergrad in physics major? Um, what advice would I give? Well, I'll give you like the, um, <clears throat> I will give you the, uh, I'll give you the general advice, like the one that you gotta like, you gotta say to everybody. And then I'll give you something that I specifically think will be very helpful, very pragmatic and, and helpful thing. Um, is uh, focus on the basics. Like it's very easy to like want to go in and tackle quantum mechanics and um, general relativity like right off the bat. That's exciting and fun. But in order to do that, in order to get there, you need things like Lagrangian mechanics, Hamiltonian mechanics, uh, even Newtonian mechanics, because you can get to this, the harmonic oscillator from that. Um, like all of that stuff you need and then in order to know that stuff you need to know the basics of newtonian mechanics of gravitational mechanics of energy so there's this very linear path through physics it's always like you know start with you know forces or vectors even start with vectors then forces then energy and then you know and then you look at harmonic oscillator and thermodynamics and stat mech and everything like that and then you go very very thoroughly through every topic right and then you take a one over of everything and then you start to get into very detailed learning about things. So then you'll start to see Lagrangian mechanics, Kepler's laws, Newtonian mechanics, but like tricky Newtonian mechanics, like polar coordinates and stuff like that. And Hamiltonian mechanics, where energy now becomes the main star of, of Lagrangian mechanics and Hamiltonian mechanics especially. And then you get to quantum mechanics and you learn all about Hamiltonian mechanics. And then you get to quantum field theory, you learn all about Lagrangian mechanics. But again, it's a lot more complicated now because the Lagrangians, the Lagrangians, whew, been a while since I've done a lot of particle physics. <laughs> um... You know, the Lagrangians that are in particle physics are very complicated. And if you don't focus on what Lagrange, Lagrangian even is when you're learning Taylor from uh, John Taylor or Landown Lipschitz, I don't know what else is a big classic mechanics book. Um, probably Griffith's got one. He's got everything else. Um, <clears throat> but then, like, once you get to, you know, so if you don't learn the original Lagrangian mechanics, then you won't be able to do quantum field theory Lagrangian mechanics, which was one of the things I struggled with. And then if you don't learn Newton's laws thoroughly, then you're going to struggle learning Lagrangian mechanics. So it's all very linear. So focus very, very heavily on each subject as you go and try to only look at the end game stuff as inspiration, as like exciting things, but not necessarily stuff where you're going to be spending a ton of time uh, going deep into the, um, into the literature. Uh, <laughs> hi Nick, good to see you. Everything's a harmonic oscillator. It's true. It's true. Um, I was gonna say that even when you get to like the ladder operations in quantum mechanics, it's all just ha simple harmonic oscillator stuff. The system of equations that defines motion in a simple harmonic oscillator is easily applied to atoms on a lattice. So you'll get to that like step function or step, what are they, the uh, ladder operations in uh, quantum mechanics where you go right back into uh, the solutions of that are simple harmonic motion. It's crazy. So um, what was the also thing I wanted to see? No Justin command. Good to see you too, Bigly. I said, we'll say Lobos. Oh, it's Lobos. Good to see you, Lobos. Um, very true. Me trying to wrap my head around general relativity in my first year caused me quite some headaches. Yeah. <laughs> I got... Um, I got very ambitious and bought Weinberg's book before I even went back to school. Steven Weinberg's general relativity book before I even went back to school. And I actually, because I studied math when I was younger, I could read it and I liked it, the special relativity stuff. As soon as you get past special relativity, it is so incoherent <laughs> for anybody who has not gotten there and anybody who's not like worked their way up through tensor algebra and things like that. Steven Weinberg is rough. Um, and that was with like four years of math a long a long time ago, but four years of math, period. Um, <clears throat> so imagine just like being a fresh undergraduate, no math, no physics training, and just trying to pick up a book like from general relativity. It's exciting, it's fun, but it might not necessarily be beneficial, I guess I should say. <laughs> uh, 
The career of a young theoretical physicist consists of treating the harmonic oscillator in every increasing level of abstraction. Sidney Colvin. What a great quote. <clears throat> um, yeah, Sidney Colvin's the boss. Yeah, and the symmetry stuff is awesome. Um, what other questions do you have for me? Let's see here. We are going to do a poll question at the end, too. Um, I wanted to feel everybody's uh, ideas out about the uh the what is it the the you know the uh cosmological model that we're using right now lambda cdm been some pretty interesting pretty interesting things coming out about that over the past few years but we're gonna get the j i think we're gonna get the james Webb telescope at the end of the year and then it will be i mean i think we're gonna have some pretty conclusive results about what model of cosmology we need to go down or if we should have a model at all um but yeah, Lambda CDM looks like it might be struggling. So we're going to talk about that towards the end. Uh, have you remembered perfectly all the formula from other topic like fluids, electromagnet? No, absolutely not. I have all these books for that. <laughs> I tell my students when I'm teaching, I always tell my students, that my goal as a teacher is not for you to leave and then know how to do Gauss's law for the rest of your life. Like I never go into my teaching you know, I never approach a class and like, I'm going to teach you how to do Gauss's law and you're going to remember it for the rest of your life. I'm going to test you on it. You're going to do homework. You're going to get all of this stuff. You're going to take labs on it. And then by the time you get out of here, you're going to know Gauss's law so well that you'll be answering questions for the rest of your life. That's, not, that's so unrealistic. So my goal, and it's a, it's a hard goal. I'm not going to lie. I, I, I think my actual realistic goal is very difficult, but my realistic goal is to teach them well enough so that when they get to that stage that we talked about earlier where you know they're going to be out on their own researching and they're going to come across things like that right that they'll be able to now this is of course engineering students so they're much more likely to see gauss's law than we are in theoretical physics so it's more applicable to them i guess <laughs> but um you know you could just do green's functions for a physicist and apply the same method um but my goal is to you know teach them gauss's law well enough so that when they get out to the real world, if they ever, uh, uh, you know, find a situation where they need it, they'll be able to relook at the textbook, relook, you know, Google stuff, and be able to coherently understand all of the material. That's my goal, and that's a very difficult. I think that's a difficult challenge. I think trying to get them to know how to do Gauss's law for the rest of their life is impossible. But if they can pick it up with a few days of refreshers, you know, and like, this is, you know, this is what you do here. Like I always have like three steps for Gauss's law. It's identify the symmetry, write the E field as a function of Q enclosed, and then solve a case by case basis. So like, that's my three steps. So I don't expect them to remember the three steps and everything like that. However, if they can get to the point where, you know, they can look it up and use it later, I've done my job and I feel very happy about that. Um, so grades kind of ruin that, but <laughs> I think grades actually work against that goal um, currently. So when I, if I do lecture again, well, I hope I'll lecture again, but when I will say when I lecture again, <laughs> I hope this summer was not a one-off when I lecture again, uh, I'm hoping to like, now that I have all the material done and I've lectured once and stuff, I'm hoping to be a little bit more experimental with how I do grades and whatnot. Uh, you know, who has a good information on how to do grades is um, three blue, one brown. And uh, Simulios, James, I forget James's last name, but Simulios over on Twitch. Um, I've heard them both talk about it and their models for teaching are pretty interesting. Um, yeah, definitely interesting. And it's, it's a common model. I wrote, he, like uh, Grant had a bunch of different names for it, but I don't remember what it was. But uh, yeah, very interesting. I use Gauss's law that often. It's impossible to ever forget it again. That's great though. Like what well, you'll find out once you do researching in a certain field, you'll use information enough where you'll never forget it again. Like I'll probably always remember what the spin of what this, what spin, you know, how we understand spin at this point in our, in our uh, understanding of physics, uh, quantum spin that is, but like, you know, I mean, I suppose if I never use it again, I might forget it. James Schloss, there it is, Schloss. Forgot, the, forgot his last name. But yeah, but Simulos, we all know. We've rated him a bunch of times over on Twitch. Um, <clears throat> do we need master's maths? Uh, all topics till undergrad very perfectly or just sufficient to have a basic grip on all topics? 
Um, usually it's pretty self-contained. You'll take some math, and what I mean by self-contained is you'll learn some math as you go in physics. Um, it is self-contained in that sense, but you also take math classes to sort of fill in the gaps or to get more practice or both. Um, like, I'll give you another example. Um, when I teach, the first day I always teach, uh, first day I always teach discussion as a TA. Um, we always have the, uh, I always do like a day on integration where I tell my class that they don't know what a line is. You know, that's the starting, that's the start. You start from not knowing what a line is, but you know what a point is and you know how to do integration, <laughs> which always makes me chuckle, but it's a fun exercise to try, right? So can you get a line out of a point by integrating? And of course the answer is yes. If you have a, a uh, if you know, you know, you got to integrate from some zero length to some length L, then you can integrate easily from zero to L and get an, a line. And then the next one is, can you integrate from a line to a square or a rectangle or, you know, a two dimensional object? And the answer is, you know, of course you can, you know, you, you have a length L and then you have a width of, of infinites, an infinitesimally small width, and then you integrate like that. Right. And then you do that again for, you know, volume, right? But then they're all like, okay, so this is kind of silly. We, you know, we end up deriving the volume of a sphere, which is kind of cool, right? You know, but it's pretty like, you know, everybody knows the volume of a sphere by then. Big deal, right? And then, you know, two weeks later, I'm introducing them how to take a point charge and integrate it into a charge density. And like, then they're all like shocked. <laughs> so of course you need a calculus because I'm not gonna, we don't teach integration. But like I'll teach you how to do integrals, and you can do the you know I'll te I'll teach the the u substitution or a power law, inverse power law or whatever it is, um, and even the trig identities if you want to see me during office hours, we'll treat some some trig inter identity integrals or whatnot, trig substitutions that's what they're called, and uh, but is it enough? No, you need to take a full class dedicated to integration and everything like that. So that's why you take all the calculuses and things like that. Um, take the maths. Being weak in math really made upper physics harder. Yeah, like, because when you get to quantum mechanics, you gotta do linear algebra. <laughs> like, and, it, and you don't need to take a linear algebra course to do quantum mechanics, but it is hard. It is very, it is, it is so much easier if you know how to do linear algebra. Although I have to admit, and Nick and I had this conversation once, um, <clears throat> is that if you take linear algebra, then you're automatically gonna want to think in the poly. Uh, in the poly matrix version of quantum mechanics, where all or not poly matrix, what is it called? Um, there's bras and cats, and then there's is it polyform? No, I don't remember what it's called. Maybe someone can refresh my memory on this. This the Dirac notation and the poly notation, where poly notations, vectors, and matrices. You automatically want to think like that, and you're going to convert everything into matrices instead of working bras and cats. And it's so much easier to work in browsing cats. <laughs> so when you take linear algebra, you will have that, you know, you will have that desire to work in browsing cat or the desire to work in, in vectors and matrices, uh, where you want to convert everything. Um, but it is better to work in browsing cats because soon things get really hairy if you want to try to write everything out in in uh, in, in vectors and matrices. Uh, if your goal is theory theory, then you'll end up learning a lot of math, approximately the same level as a math student, except you won't have to worry about series convergence. <laughs> oh, that's good. Uh, what is your motivation behind starting a YouTube channel and how do you find time to make videos since physicists are really busy in research? Uh, great question. Well, for starters, the time that I put into the channel up till now, uh, both the Twitch and the YouTube channel is going to change because it was way too much. Um, yeah, I don't, I think it was, it was, I used it as a crutch and it was a, a very unhealthy crutch. There's a bunch of unhealthy things I was doing <laughs> that were very, very bad for my health. And that's why I ended up in the hospital. So, <laughs> so we're going to go, it's going to be the new schedule when it comes back is going to be much less. Um, but why do I do it is because I think it's very important for my career. Yeah. I do think it's very important for my career. I think it's very important for the public that we're forward facing about the things that we're studying and, and working on. Um, uh, science communication has always been a huge part of my life since, well, I didn't mean, always, but since I decided to go back to school and I was, you know, chopping vegetables in the kitchen, listening to world science festival and listening to, um, I don't even know. I was listening to all sorts of, of everything. I started with star talk radio, but you know, it's kind of, eh, eh, eh. but the world science festival was really cool. <laughs> and then audiobooks, Leonard Susskind's videos on YouTube are fantastic. Um, so I was just listening to all this stuff and like, it inspired me to do physics. It inspired me to go back to school and to, and to get my, get 
that part of my life cleaned up at least. <laughs> so then here I was. So then like when I wanted to, uh, you know, I, I wanted, so then I was working with the World Science Festival and doing things with them, which was a lot of fun. But then, you know, we went to COVID and then I noticed that there's a lot of people that needed help with physics. Like there's just students, my students especially were coming to me and be like, I'm trying to make time with the, the professors. I can't get a hold of them. I noticed this on Reddit was happening a lot. Reddit was a lot of, you know, how do I get in touch with my professor? How do I get in touch with the instructor? Uh, I can't like they're they're not ignoring emails and all that stuff. So I was like, I can make a place for students to come, hang out, chat, and ask questions. And it started for just introductory physics, <laughs> but it very quickly turned into people asking me questions th about things I had no idea. So I just started answering questions. And if we didn't know, we looked things up. Um, it was a lot of fun because you can look stuff up pretty straightforwardly on this together. Uh, which we'll do in a little bit, like I said. I have some stuff to show you. We're gonna go to the blackboard in a little bit. Woo! Does this work? I should check. Hold on. Yeah, okay, good. We're gonna go blackboard in a little bit and learn about some complexity theory. Um, and then, uh, what else? Yeah, so then, so yeah, so what was I saying? Uh, I, yeah, so quickly it just changed into harboring a community of people who cared about physics, loved about physics, and loved talking about physics. And then soon I started teaching people stuff. And I felt like it was very healthy for me to teach people stuff. And then it became unhealthy. Um, but that was my own fault. So we're working on that. Um, but when I do come back, it will be less. Uh, but I don't know what, I don't know how and, and when yet. Um, like I said, I got to get used to some changes. Um, but you'll be pleased to know that I'm running. Justin, I'm running. Not as far as you run, but I'm running. Um, every morning or playing tennis. I played tennis once. It was laughable. Mostly importantly, you show people how to look things up. That is actually a very good talent to have is looking things up. Cause you can just Google anything. But like when you Google research, it's like, like, what are you going to Google? Like, how do you know it's credible? Where are you getting it from? It, there's so many things that go into it. Uh, I spent three pages working out a homework problem using differential equations, specifically Laplace transforms. I was correct, but the Brockett solution was three lines long. I don't, it's like, I don't want to do it. I don't want to learn Brockett, bras and cats. It's always so, so much of a struggle to start learning bras and cats. And then once you do, you realize it's so fast. Um, and now that's like all I think about cause I'm in quantum circuits. Um, but yeah, I am, I am exercising. And I'm seeing doctors and, t and taking care and doing things that are going to, that I've been putting off for, ooh, geez. I was diagnosed with the issue four years ago. I just ignored it. Um, yeah. So anyways, <laughs> I'm getting it fixed. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so let's, uh, let's see. I hope I didn't miss anything else here. He's actually secretly eating pork sausages of fried beef. No, I still can't eat any of the stuff that I couldn't eat before. It, it will screw me up terrible. Hey, good education. Good to see you. Good news. Going to be less content. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's going to be good content, though. The thing is, is like I like to make my content. I like to teach physics at a high level um, or, you know, uh, under like mid undergrad to high or to low grad levels where I like to teach my physics. And it's everywhere in between. Right. Uh, like sophomore to first or second year. That's where I like to keep my content and teach it. And unfortunately it takes time. It takes time to write notes, to do research. I was going to tell you guys about research. Like it, it's one thing to look up archive and to like look up these articles, but like you don't know, like you can look at citations and see that something's had 30 citations. What does that mean that something has had 30 citations? You don't know if they're good citations or if they're bad citations. What if it's 30 hit pieces? <laughs> like you have no idea. So it's really important to take these things and like work and to like look at them with a fine tooth comb and that requires time. And uh, and also, I you know, I've showed you guys that. I, when we look things up and the stuff I was gonna show you today, it's not only looking up what the papers are, we have to look up who wrote them. Are they coming from a credible place? Where are they now? Um, so there's a lot of stuff to consider. Um, <clears throat> well, have fun folks and have a good YouTube stream. And <laughs> the effects are slowly disappearing and I need a buzz to read books. Well, take care. <laughs> What's it like to go from just studying physics to do research? I'm actually kind of afraid. Uh, I'm not smart enough to do research. However, I have all the background knowledge I need. I don't think it's as black and white as other people like it to be. Um, I don't see it. But like even my advisor before was telling me that it's like black and white, my former advisor. And I don't see it. 
He was like, okay, we've done enough reading. Let's do some calculations. I have never, ever believed that to be the case. You will always be learning new things. I am always reading. I'm always finding new papers, printing them out, reading them thoroughly, marking them up, finding different papers, printing them out or moving them around in files, marking them up. Like there's so many things that go into like research that like I don't ever see myself. I even took a book out from the library the other day. It's a textbook from 1985. <laughs> like some people might not think that's research, but it's 100% research because I'm learning a topic that I don't know anything about. Which here, I'll show you. Anybody know anything about a Finsler metric? Never heard of it before this week. But apparently it's super popular in quantum information theory. Okay, maybe not super popular. It shows up in quantum information theory. And uh, yeah, like people are trying to find minimum paths for information through quantum computing. And apparently it's a geodesic on a, fin on a Finsler uh, manifold. Wild. So I got to figure out what a Finsler manifold is. But see, I don't know what a Finsler manifold is. But I know enough about geodesics. I know how to work through a geodesic equation. I know, um, you know, I know about some quantum information stuff. I've studied some relativistic quantum information. I don't think this is necessarily relativistic, but in case it is. Um, or even just like applying certain things. There's a lot of group theory involved. I've learned some group theory here and there. And all of it is just, you know, you find something and you have to read about it and learn about it. And then eventually you can use it. But it's not ever like a... I don't ever find it to be like a cut and dry, like, okay, I will no longer be reading textbooks or papers. I will just be in my calculations. It's always kind of like a mix of like writing stuff down, reading more papers, writing more stuff down. And then how do you kind of like take the things that you've learned from all of these different places and sort of mesh them into one thing. Now there's always going to be like some back and forth. You know what I mean? Like there's going to be times where you're reading and times where you're writing and calculating, but there's never a time where it's like, I will no longer be reading or writing or, or reading textbooks or papers anymore you know what i mean there's always going to be that it's kind of like back and forth back and forth um but i think when you actually get to the point where you understand a subject really really well then you'll know then you'll know when you need to do calculations to kind of like figure out some some information there's definitely this like uh, mentality where like good ideas will always be showing up but if you don't know the first step in how to write it down mathematically it's probably not worth investing your time in right now instead the best thing to do is to write it down in a notebook or and like go back and look at it later there's things that I think about all the time. Um, I had an idea at the end of lecturing that I thought was a really, really cool idea about time. I have no idea how to process that information right now. So I just wrote it down and I left it and I'll hopefully revisit it when I have time to figure out um, this, you know, this mathematics that will go with it. But the time's not now. <laughs> so instead I just every once in a while I think about it I might google some stuff try to find a couple papers or something to read that might shed some light on the mathematics but eventually I'll get to the point where I'll know the mathematics and to handle it or I'll find out it's a bad question that happens too um I had a good idea like a year ago it turned out to be it turned out it was a bad question you know it is what it is um <clears throat> let's see here uh looking through other perspective how how this phrase is used in early physics and today's physics has it really helped to get some of the finest theory in physics? Okay, so what you're asking is more about like, um, yeah, I mean, we do that all the time. Uh, one thing that is that Justin gave us a bit of advice about, and that was how is string theory used? I have a video that's like five minutes long on the channel um, where Justin very eloquently tells us about how string theory is used in uh, in real world. In, I shouldn't say real world, wow. <laughs> burn um no how string theory is used in a lot of cases for a lot of a lot of string theorists and that is that that the math will show us something enlightening about the physics of something that's not string theory <laughs> um cut the string <laughs> no it, it will show us something about um about the real world that's not i gotta stop saying that <laughs> about a physical phenomenon that's not string theory and we can actually use that mathematics because it's more enlightening um yeah another thing is someone asked me about supersymmetry i'd love to do a video on supersymmetry um you know really cut and dry just like i do on the board where like i introduce the su supersymmetric operators what do i do it in justin though i'm an n equals one supersymmetry um but which, that's not very popular i don't think n equals four is kind of like 
the you know the pop the big one right n equals four is kind of like where everybody's at these days i think um but i'm i the only super symmetry i know is n equals one and that is the supercharges are just the, the two cues that do a simple boson to tr fermion transform and back and forth just introduce the Susie algebra yeah that's pretty much it um, and that's pretty much all I can do with that. I might go into super fields and how you can get out of them. I think the super fields are what makes super symmetry awesome. And that's the different perspective stuff that I'm trying to get to. Is that like once you introduce Gauss, uh, what are they, Grassman, Grassman numbers, um, you get these really cool effects. And then at the end, you just integrate the Grassmans away, the Grassmans variables away, and, and boom, <laughs> you get a real interaction. Well, what we would hope to be a real interaction. Um, <clears throat> But <laughs> no dice <laughs> so far, at least. Um, but there's been some cool things with supersymmetry. Like there's applications of supersymmetry in condensed matter, which I find really cool. Um, but I don't know. Again, it's that thing about whether or not it actually matches up with physical phenomenon, and that I'm not 100% sure on. Um, but again, using a topic like supersymmetry to learn about some sort of physical phenomenon is something that's done. Um, I'm actually going to a talk on Wednesday, uh, where I hope. To talk to one of uh, one of the people who studied a lot of super symmetry, even some super stri string theory, um, who's now interested in magnetic monopoles. So uh, hopefully, um, there's going to be some cool stuff about super symmetry and magnetic monopoles. But I don't know. Um, I don't know where his research went in the past couple of years because I heard him talk a few years ago. Uh, so I'll go check that out on Wednesday, and then maybe I'll report back. <laughs> uh, again, if you don't normally follow me over on the Twitch channel, you should do so. The link for that is in the description below. And apparently streaming on YouTube does better with the, with an algorithm, and the way that you can do that algorithm is by liking the video. So feel free to like the video. That would help, or like the stream, and that would help more people find this stream. Um, but also, like I said, I'll be generally streaming over on Twitch still. Uh, is it? No, it's it's turning. It's John turning. Um, but yeah, that's another thing I'm doing is I'm going to be traveling to Cornell a lot this semester. Uh, m half of my group is out there and pretty much like my research, I guess you want to say research partner. The, um, the researcher I do the most work with, we have the most overlap in our interests and also our, you know, uh, abilities. But also we complement each other nicely because he didn't do any particle physics, but instead he did coding. And that's, uh, that's like one of my like worst <laughs> things is coding but like you know i've been working on complexity theory he's been working on classical shadows and the two of those things help a lot so he's out there and uh so i'm going out to cornell like i'm going out wednesday i'll be out to cornell pretty much like three or four times a month so that's going to be in the getting away and that's on wednesdays and fridays so those are as you guys know those are my stream days usually so um yeah so that's going to be something that i got to focus on too because collaboration is super important um, helps me focus and helps me work really hard. So that's going to be important for me, but it's also important for the research because, you know, we, we need to work together on these things. Um, at least sometimes. Um, I wanted to say something else too, but I forgot. What was it? Oh, yeah. So I'm still going to be streaming over on Twitch for now. Um, I might switch to YouTube eventually. The thing I really am disappointed with the YouTube is there's no community interaction stuff i would have loved to do something with you guys today um game wise like we can't do gre marbles such a bummer so you gotta go follow me over on twitch so when we get back we'll do gre marbles again or something like that we can't do click maps click maps all we got are poles so we need some extensions <laughs> if if there's enough If there's enough community interaction, I would probably come over here. But there's just not. Um, and as a educator on Twitch, that's super important to me. So, um, that's what I want. Or else I'm probably just going to stay there. <laughs> um, yeah, I read a good post today about how like the uh, Twitch's focus is still heavily on the viewer, which I think is kind of good. Um, but yeah, we'll see. I'm sure YouTube will probably come around eventually and get some good stuff. Um, but in the meantime, I'll stay over there. So, the, the, uh, yeah, so if you want to follow me over there, and if you want to keep updates about when I'm going to be streaming, when my schedule gets fixed and everything like that, then join the Discord. Link for that is also down below. Also, it's a good place to ask questions and get answers and answer things yourself uh, because we have lots of physicists in there, but we also have lots of students who ask questions all the time, um, several times a week at least. So it's not you don't have to be super active to be you know, kept up to date with everything. But so far, it's been a lot of fun. 
All right, we have two things to do today. The first one is quantum complexity theory. And then after that, we're going to talk about the cosmological model that we're using and how that is, uh, how that's, how the past couple years have been with that. We have, I have three papers we can take a look at, just the abstracts, and then one of them has a, a kind of an interesting section to take a look at, um, and we will do that. Um, but in the meantime, let's switch microphones, switch cameras, get over there, and we'll do some quantum complexity. It's gonna take me a second to figure out if this is working or not, though. It looks like it's working, although it looks low. Is it low? Am I not loud enough? How's that? Looks better. <clears throat> oh, this is still on. Hold on, I gotta get rid of that. It works. It does work. I have to get rid of. Okay, so that's gone. I had like my Twitch alerts. I don't have YouTube. It's like YouTube alerts, but they're over on the other channel. I can put them over here probably, but then there's a chat. Yeah, the chat window will get in the way. Never mind. We'll just leave the alerts off for now. YouTube has come a long way since I started streaming over on Twitch, though. Because when I started streaming over on Twitch, there was nothing. <laughs> nothing. So I, I, ha I, have, I have faith that they'll come a long way in the next few. In the next year or so. <sighs> not on Twitch, say. Not today. Uh, next time, I'll be back on Twitch. This is our 1,000 sub stream. We're celebrating a thousand subs. We reached it. We did it. A thousand subs. <clears throat> Inf learning information about physics. So, we're doing questions and answers. You can feel free to ask questions. I, the cue is doesn't work. I don't know why. It should work. I set it up. It doesn't seem to work. Someone should try it. We should try it again just to see if it works. But I mean, Chad's moving really slow. So, if you want to ask me a question, you can absolutely feel free to. Yeah, it's not going to work. I don't know why. Oh, well. Um, unless I just didn't change it. Maybe it's join still. Does a thousand subs make us Navy or sandwich shop? A Navy or sandwich shop? I don't know. Probably a sandwich shop. Probably a sandwich shop. What are they, submarines? No, what do people call it? Hoagies? Who's calling them hoagies? Just stop. No, I'm just kidding. You can call them hoagies if you want. Okay, let's go. <clears throat> yeah, so this is our thousand sub stream. So the VOD will be up afterwards. I think I'll probably also... <laughs> can I draw a pony? Okay, one pony. One pony. One beautiful YouTube pony. <clears throat> Pony for the, uh... I'll just do one. <clears throat> Beautiful. Beautiful. That was a good one. Classic. It's a classic. We're revisiting a classic for this one. <clears throat> um, so anyways, uh, I'm going to erase the pony now. Yeah, so this is a thousand sub stream. We're going to be talking about com uh, quantum complexity theory. Now, when I started looking at quantum complexity theory, I did not know. I didn't know. Let me kill these lights, too. I didn't know that this was a <laughs> YouTube monk ass. Oh, come on. I'll go back. I promise. I'll go back to Twitch. I will. But maybe eventually we'll switch over. It's either way. We're all together. We're having fun. That's what matters, right? Um, <clears throat> so... I didn't realize quantum complexity theory was such a rich and vast field of information. Uh, I thought, and it's because... <laughs> you know funny? The crowd goes wild. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, yeah, so it's, it's like one of these things where it's relatively easy. I don't want to say easy. It doesn't require a ton of work to get into. Like, you can just start Googling stuff and it makes sense. Like, it gets in there and, like, <laughs> I tried any these kids. Um, it, you, you can, like, <clears throat> I don't even know how to say it. It's, um, it's one of these topics where you can easily get into by just looking up the information. But to know a lot about it, it requires intense study. Like, you have, like, these are done with mathematical proofs. <laughs> 
and like, I don't know. Like, I don't remember how to do a proof that well. Like you can do, especially these types of proofs. So we're gonna do, I've been looking at this for a few weeks now. Um, also, you know, dealing with a lot of other things for the past few weeks, so let's be real about it. Um, so we're gonna do a, like a very base level, entry level, you know, introduction to the two major classes of quantum complexity theory, namely, uh, so and then, and then the classical analog. So we'll talk about four classes generally. Um, and then we're gonna talk about why it matters. And like, I'll introduce you to where the field really takes off. And if you're interested in studying it, there is just so much, what? <laughs> Don't be sorry, baby. Um, yeah, there's so much, there's so many questions, there's so many things to look at with uh, quantum complexity theory. So, uh, but let's get started. What is complexity theory? <sighs> I think that's kind of an interesting thing right off the bat. And complexity theory is, I'm not going to write out all these definitions. If you guys are interested in having my notes made available, let me know, because I wasn't planning on it. Um, but what we'll do is we'll just, I'll write out the def word and we'll talk about what it is, and then I might write down some stuff about it kind of in individually. But uh, complexity theory is the subject of classifying the difficult, the difficulty of various computational problems. So classifying... Difficulty of problems. Now they are, they come in two general flavors. Now I guess the thing is, is like when you actually start to get into the complexity theory, and I would say even more so for quantum complexity theory, uh, you really have to, <laughs> you really have to be understanding that there is lots and lots of complexity classes. Like way too many complexity classes. Um, but I get it, like there's each, there's subtle differ differences between each complexity class. And um, I think there's like, I don't know, I read a paper that said like there was 37 of them or something like that. Um, between classical and quantum, there's like 37 complexity classes. This is just so much. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, I didn't do any more digging. I just casually read it in a paper. Um, so much. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the two major ones. Uh, and that is P, which stands for polynomial time. Um, and those are problems that can be solved in polynomial time. Um, computational problems that can be solved in polynomial time on a classical computer. So solvable in polynomial time. So the bigger the problem gets, uh, the bigger the problem gets, the, you know, the amount of time it takes to, to solve it on a classical computer, the algorithm to solve it, is polynomial. It's not exponential. That's the big difference. Um, and then, uh, and then NP is the other big one. Um, and then I'll give an example of both. This is called non-deterministic polynomial time. And these are basically compu computational problems um, which have solutions that can be quickly checked. Solutions that can be quickly checked. And what's quickly checked even mean? Quickly checked means checked in a, in a polynomial time classical machine. So the algorithm that's, you know, solves a problem that's NP will solve it by uh, taking the solution to the problem and checking it in polynomial time. So here, let's talk about one of the biggest examples of, of this, right? <clears throat> Um, prime factors of an integer. This problem does not have a solution in P. Okay? There's no algorithm that can solve prime factors of an integer. However, if you have a number with prime, and you have factors of that number, you can check to see if they're factors. You can check to see if they're primes. Um, but again, um, you cannot just take a number and apply an algorithm that will write out all of the factors of it in polynomial time, okay? Um, <clears throat> I think that's kind of like one of the, the key things to this. Um, but li this, this leads to the famous problem, right? Is, is uh, P equal to NP? 
I mean, this is a millennium problem. There's seven problems, and each of the seven problems are worth a million dollars if you can solve them. One of them is has to do with complexity classes. Is P is a problem, or uh, yeah, is, are the problems that can be solved in polynomial time the same things as the problems that, if you have solutions, can be checked in polynomial time? I think it's very interesting and very important. Uh, they're called verifiers. So there's a verifying function. Is this in focus? Yeah, that's in focus. <clears throat> there's verifiers. And the verifiers are what's verifying the solution, right? And a very important thing is that they have to run in polynomial time. That's what's important about this problem. So the question that's worth a million dollars is, is P identically equal to NP or is it just a subset of NP? <clears throat> so um, that's a famous problem worth a lot of money. Now, uh, oh, we should probably talk really quickly about NP complete. What is NP complete? NP complete is a class of problems where uh, if you have a solution, like for example, you can have a problem that you can solve using NP, that is NP complete, so you can have a verifier, the, verify, the verifier works in polynomial time to check solutions, blah, 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 and <clears throat> you can, uh, if that's true, then it can be applied to all of the NP problems. So here's the question. Can you do factoring? Is factoring an NP complete problem? And the answer is we don't know. People are still working on that. Um, but there's something that's kind of interesting about the factoring that we're gonna get into very soon, right? That's not the same thing as, as you might think. Um, <clears throat> it is a little bit different. So the, uh, let's see, where was I? Yeah, so let's talk about the connection between classical and quantum, right? There's a quantum analog for all of these. Of course, if you have any questions at any time, I can, I'm looking right at chat. So feel free to ask questions. The bonus of doing this live, <laughs> now if you watch me on Twitch, you know this, but the bonus of doing it live is to, is to have interaction with someone who's talking about this. Um, so we haven't really gotten into the quantum stuff yet, but we're about to. So if you have any questions with quantum classical or qu complexity theory or anything like that, always feel free to ask. Either you can do it now, and I'll look at it when I look, or you can do it when I'm done. That's fine, too. Um, but yeah, it's the benefit of doing live stuff, is we can actually do this little interaction together. <clears throat> uh, but now we got to get into the quantum, uh, the quantum part of it. And there's analogs, if you can believe it, to P and NP in quantum computing. <clears throat> and those are the two, the two analogs that we're going to pay attention to. Now, they have subsets these analogs have subsets that we're not going to talk about that are classical but again we're just not going to talk about them um they're part of these you know extra extra complexity classes that we don't really need to get into um <clears throat> to get like a good base footing into complexity theory uh but anyways let's keep going i think i want a new piece of chalk Ooh, hagaromo chalk don't mind if i do um, all right, BQP. The quantum analog to P, okay? Now, BQP is the quantum analog to P. Uh, that is, the problems are solvable by a quantum computer in polynomial time. So I'm going to give you two examples. Ready for this? Here we go. <laughs> Factoring. <laughs> this is what's cool about it. Shor's algorithm factors numbers, right? That's that's something that I'm just sort of starting to look into a little bit. I don't know a ton about it. I am certain there are people who know more about Shor's algorithm that are in this community. I can promise you that that's the case. I so if you have a question about Shor's algorithm, maybe best to write it in Discord. However, it does solve it does factor things, and it's the quantum analog to P. Right? So the question is, we have a solution to factoring, a P that will factor a problem, right? Oh, a Q BQP, right? So then the question is, is factoring NP complete? Because <laughs> it doesn't take it away from the NP class, right? It doesn't put it in P, there's a subset of NP and BQP, is what I'm getting at. 
There's some things that are B, Q, P, and, and, and N, P that are not in P, right? So then the question is, is factoring N, P complete? And it makes it a very important question. Because remember, if it's N, P complete, then it can be applied to any of the N, P problems. Ah, thank you, Justin. Yeah, all that stuff should be in the description, too. I don't know, um, I don't know how the description works. I'll ask you guys that after the lesson. We'll talk about that. Because I want to make sure the description is easily accessible. Um, but anyways, quantum analog to P uh, <coughs> is the BQP. And that is, again, uh, algorithms or problems that have solution that are solvable by a quantum computing in polynomial time. So factoring is the one. Um, factoring is an NP, but it's uh, solvable on a quantum computing. It is unknown if factoring is NP complete. That was what I just said. Uh, Right, and if it is NP complete, that means we can apply Shor's algorithm to any NP problem, which would be really cool. Um, but that requires, again, like this is the, <laughs> that's one of those things where it's like, it's easy to see this, right? It's easy to understand that this stuff is, is happening. But then once you want to get to the part where you actually prove it, <laughs> it's like, God bless. <laughs> God bless. <laughs> that is not an easy task. Um, we should call sh short shorts short <laughs> we could do i have shores on i might have shores on Tyrion's not here he normally is the one that yells at me about the length of my shorts i have to remind him i'm a dad now when you have when you're a dad you wear dad clothes this is normal to me all right let's keep going <laughs> <laughs> um, the other one is quantum dynamics. Uh, scattering amplitudes is a BQP complete problem. Oh, it's possibly a BQP complete. It is definitely a BQP. Um, so factoring and then quantum dynamics. <clears throat> think time evolution. Think scattering amplitudes. Scalar field theory is possibly BQP complete. I don't, I didn't, there's a paper on it. I didn't um, absorb the information well enough. So I don't want to like get involved and say, yes, it is definitely, uh, it is definitely BQP complete, which means it would solve all of the problems in BQP, the algorithm. But it is, um, but scalar field theory is definitely BQP. And this is that, this is that overlap I was talking about. The information between <laughs> YouTube shorts. <laughs> um, so this is that. <laughs> Boo. Uh, it's good to see you, Alan. Um, so the, uh, God, um, you totally made me lose my train of thought with that one. YouTube shorts. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Scalar field theory. That's that connection that I was talking about. Scatting. Whoa, I just saw that. Bop -da -bop -da -bop -da Get it? That's scattering theory. Scattering theory. Much better than scattering theory. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so that's that connection between quantum field theory and complexity theory. It's, it's trying to prove these things in complexity theory, but again, um, <clears throat> there's more to it, and we'll talk about that as well. Uh, next up, if BQP is the analog to P, then there must be an analog to NP. I kind of already told you that. And that is called QMA. BQP stands for Bounded Error Quantum Polynomial Time. And QMA <laughs> stands for Quantum Merlin Arthur. Which, <clears throat> does anybody have any idea why Merlin and Arthur... I, I, it's not the authors. I don't think so, at least. Does anyone have any idea? I found this out this morning, of all times. I've always just thought, okay, that must be named after the authors. It's not. <laughs> I don't think it is, at least. If it is, then everybody keeps using it, this example of it. And I'm just like, okay. I found it in like five places today. And I was like, this is wild. But it turns out that Quantum Merlin Arthur is a reference to the Sword in the Stone. <laughs> Which is crazy. <clears throat> um, Merlin is this, you know, wizard, this, this ultimate computing power, like all of the answers and stuff. But Arthur is like the, the verifier. Arthur is the classical, like down to earth <clears throat> guy who pulls the sword out of a stone. 
Very interesting. But nevertheless, the thing about Quantum Merling Arthur is it is analogous to, to uh, <clears throat> it's the quantum analog, analog. Quantum analog. To NP. Now this one's hard. This is a difficult complexity class. And this is, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna lie to you, I'll be completely honest, NP makes up a huge part of complexity theory, of classical complexity theory. NP makes up a huge part, a lot of problems are in NP. Um, that's like, you got uh, a lot of research in fields that I wouldn't even have thought of, like cancer research in, in, for computational stuff. In fact, I'm sure Tyrion would probably know of some things that he studies in, in uh, or that he has studied or um, or supports researchers in his uh, computational ways that he does. Tyrion's our, our low-key brilliant programmer that <laughs> just talks about drinking all the time. Um, but yeah, I'm sure he would be able to talk about NP problems in uh, his research, maybe. Um, but NP makes up a big field, and QMA is no different. It's the now it's analog to NP, right? It has so much. This looks weird. Let me rewrite this U. Um, it has so many problems in it. So let's talk about what it is firstly, and then we're gonna go look at a paper that discusses it very thoroughly, and then I'll link the paper, um, and you guys can take a look at it if you'd like. Um, but let's see, so for a decision problem with a polynomial time algorithm, Q. Okay, so again, this is gonna work just like NP. It's gonna need a verifier to verify a solution. Um, for every input x, then the following holds, okay? And I'm just going to read the definition. It's kind of long, um, and like I said, very complicated, <clears throat> but we'll do our best to, to understand it and unpack it. If the input x, if on the input x, the answer to the problem is yes, okay? So that's another thing about this. I don't know uh, how much of this translates to NP, but the answer has to be yes or no, okay? And I'll give you a very clear example of this in a second. Uh, the answer has to be yes. Then a witness state, and okay, we're going to call it a witness state. Um, so let's see, if we have input x, input x, and the answer yes, then there's going to be a state phi such that if you, after you apply the algorithm, after you apply, oof. I'm rusty. After you apply Q, uh, then you return X and Phi with two thirds probability. It's probabilistic, of course. Probabilistic, which means you need many measurements so you have to do a lot of measurements just like you would take a measurement from a quantum computer in order to figure out whether or not your probabilities are matching up with what you expect you need to take a lot of measurements right so just like that you need to take a bunch of measurements and then the probability if it's greater than two-thirds um <clears throat> with greater than two-thirds i should say greater than or equal to or something along the lines <laughs> uh, i heard this fraction is flexible um, but it has to be larger than the next fraction. Um, but other than that, other than that one rule that this has to be larger than the next fraction, um, then it's flexible. You can move it around a little bit. But anyways, I guess it depends on the problem itself. Um, but after you apply Q, then you return <coughs> the state X and Phi because they're separatable. I mean, you need to have the witness. Hi, Adam. Good to see you. Um, yeah, you need to have the witness, and the witness needs to, um, and you need to get this combination with a greater than two-thirds probability. Okay, <clears throat> what does that mean? Or what's the opposite of that? So if input x yields no, that's the, that's the Merlin part, then this state, ooh, I gotta look at my notes for this, <clears throat> then the witness state um, does not exist such that uh, you cannot verify this state with probability of, um, let's see, um, then after, then we'll say there's no such phi. Let's try again. 
I don't know how to write this succinctly. <laughs> uh, no such phi exists such that uh, after you apply Q, Um, let's see here. How do I write it it's the same way? That can be verified with Q with probability greater than one third. I'll just write with probability probability greater than one third. Okay, so that means, so there's two things. There's a yes and a no. Okay, so what's, a, what's an example of this so we can actually sink our teeth into something other than these words that are, you know, me trying to cut down a long definition. Um, and that is that, like, a ground state. A ground state's a great example of where, of a problem that's QMA, probably QMA complete. There's a lot of things we, I'll show you. Um, steered 500 bits. Thank you. I did not get a notification. <clears throat> Did you cheer it here? I don't know how to do bits on, <laughs> or did you do it over on my YouTube? If you did it, or Twitch, if you did it over my Twitch, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you either way, wherever it shows up. Um, but I do appreciate it. Um, and I'll get all those notifications afterwards, but thank you very much, I do appreciate it. Right now, I, I only have YouTube things open, and I'm new to the YouTube thing. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Uh, this content is brought thanks to viewers like you. Anyways, so yeah, so finding the ground state of a Hamiltonian is super important. Okay, so that's also a very hard thing. There's like hundreds of ways to find ground states of Hamiltonians. One famous one, bringing it back, ready, here we go, harmonic oscillator. <laughs> the harmonic oscillator has solutions to equations that can yield the ground state with these ladder operations, things I was talking about before. So one way to find the ground state of a Hamiltonian would be to like, you know, write out force equations that are descriptions of how the particles will move to, to govern by, you know, the laws of, of force. And then to, to write some, uh, a matrix of these force equations that we call the dynamical matrix. You diagonalize the dynamical matrix and the solutions to this are the ground state. That's one way to do it. Um, <clears throat> solutions to this are the ground state. Under certain conditions, the solutions of the ground state. I might be forgetting some things with that example. <laughs> no, I'm hey, just kidding. You know, I don't know how this thing works, Adam. I don't know how it works. <laughs> um, either way, let's let's finish this up. So there is, yeah. So that's the example. So the ground state. So you can have this state that you might think is a ground state of a certain type of material, certain lattice of, 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 of materials, right? And you can define a Hamiltonian of interest that will help you figure out that ground state. So the ground state of the Hamiltonian is ideally what we're looking for, the lowest energy level of that Hamiltonian. And the idea is, if you write that state out, then you there should be a witness state. This is what is a QMA complete problem Think. We have a lot of methods for finding ground states, so I'm sure people have done this. But to what extent, I don't 100% know off the top of my head. Ising model's been done a lot, I think. Um, anyways, <clears throat> uh, so yeah, so you have some input state, right, that you think is the ground state, right? Out of that input state, you'll get a witness state, okay? And that witness, and then if you apply the two to the quantum, to the, the algorithm, that will run in polynomial time, then the outcome that you'll get the two, it has a two-thirds probability, over a two-thirds probability guarantee, right? right? Then you have solved the problem, right? Then you have gotten to a point where you know that there's a solution, this is the ground state of phi. And the, and the quantum part of that is like, what type of constraints does a ground state have, right? So what, things, what, what do you might think is you might think of something like with an energy well, like this, where the energy state is down in the bottom. So obviously right here this this effect is flawed, but like you might put these constraints on it where like the you know the particle is subject to this energy well. And like again, you know it's flawed because you don't know what's on either side of this. It could be like this, where there's a lower state right across that energy barrier, but you just don't know how to get there. But if you make it big enough and you have a uh, you know your um Oh, what's, what am I calling it? Locality. If you make, if you stretch out the locality of the Hamiltonian enough so it accounts for all these different states, 
then you might be able to figure out that no, your state was wrong, so the answer is no, and then you'll know that because you can't make the witness state with greater probability of one third, okay? With a probability greater than one third. So then, it, you know, you go to the next one, you apply the constraints, you get a witness state. Can you make that? And you, so you apply your algorithm and you get it with a greater than two thirds probability. And then with that constraint, with the constraint of saying this type of locality, you have found a ground state. Okay, so that's a kind of a cool thing that you can actually do with this, right, is, is and again, you'll need to figure out what all of these things mean um, in the type of model that you're applying. We'll see a little bit about that. Um, but yeah, so this is a, a pretty powerful tool, right? So now let's kind of figure out like why this stuff matters, okay? So we're gonna do, we're gonna look at a paper. <clears throat> I'm gonna, I'll leave this microphone on for this part. That way I can make a YouTube video out of this cut it up for anybody who doesn't want to watch the whole VOD. Let's see here. Um, do this, and then we'll go over here. Hey, hello everybody. Okay. <clears throat> this paper right here, let me put it in the chat. Boop, 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 boop. Pow, pow. Okay, this paper is um, the one that's on the Wikipedia that basically says QMA complete problems, and it's from 2013. And it has some interesting things to look at. Let's talk. Oh, I have to get rid of that alert stuff too. Okay, we're good. <laughs> now, <laughs> what is the complexity theory good for? Okay, so it's, it's not enough to just say, hey, this problem falls in this complexity class, this problem falls in this complexity class. We need to figure out why it matters. Otherwise, we're just putting problems in classes and it's not solving anything. And here's where the rubber meets the road on this topic, is you start putting restraints on problems, right? Like the more restraints you can put on problems, the more interesting results you can try to find, right? And then each time you put a restraint on it, you run through the whole process all over again. It, you know, if I put, you know, so locality, let's talk about that. So a K-local Hamiltonian is basically a Hamiltonian that is talking about how many, well, the short and short of it is how many neighbors are you gonna include, okay? Especially in one dimensional, lattice you know then you're just talking about how many neighbors are you going to include so one of the basic ones would just be something like this where you're looking at between neighboring sites so it's a two local Hamiltonian and you're looking at you know basically whether or not an electron is going to hop back and forth now with that example on the board that's right here next to my head right you know this this next energy well might be really far away from the first one so you're obviously going to be missing it if you're going very local in your Hamiltonian. So the, like the higher and higher you get, the harder and harder these problems are to solve, but the more accurate the solutions are going to be. Um, but a two local Hamiltonian, you might think is an interesting problem. A lot of people think it's an interesting problem, nearest neighbors, um, you know, working on either hopping or you can include, as we're gonna see, you can include other things like spin and hopping, and then those terms will, you know, add to the complexity. Um, but the thing is, is like, here are a bunch of, of times is it raining? No. Here are a bunch of times where we've put in restraints on a problem. Open my inventory. I just got an, an achievement for opening my inventory. Oh, my kids are probably playing Xbox. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that was really confusing. Um, okay, that makes sense. Uh, okay. <laughs> I know, right? Yay, I opened my inventory. Um, okay. <laughs> Oh, that is really weird. Uh, yeah, so then you, so you put these restraints on the problems, and here's a couple of them. Okay, so let's look at some of these restraints. So, theorem, Q and made complete for K greater than two is proven by Kemp, Katav, and Rejev, maybe? Um, and it's a hardness reduction from a different one we didn't get into, a different complexity class we didn't get into. Um, but it has additionally proved that it is, and then there's a bunch of them. Um, QMA complete is when K is, you know, some log N operator, I think it is. Um, <clears throat> I not really, I didn't look too much into that one. Uh, QMA complete even when K equals three with constant norms. Uh, QMA complete even when a two local on a line of eight dimensional qubits. Um, and uh, arranged on a line and only nearest neighbor interactions of present, blah, blah, blah. QMA complete even when two local on a 2D lattice. This one's kind of important. Uh, the 2D lattice leaving at Q, a two local Q um, 
Cuba MA complete makes it a challenge, right? Because that means that like, I guess we were hoping for like a symmetry in the two dimensional lattice that wouldn't be there in the one dimensional lattice to make it easier. But now we're in, we're, we're basically saying like any, well, yeah, I guess the restrictions are still up, up for grabs, but QMA complete even for interacting bosons under two body interactions. So there's, um, and a couple other ones that I'm more familiar with are the boson and Fermi Hubbard problems are all QMA complete. All of these things are QMA complete, which means that if you find an algorithm that will solve this in polynomial time in such, you know, so that, you know, just like the way we talked about, you have a solution, you put it through the Merlin part of the algorithm. It produces a witness state. You verify the witness state in polynomial time with two thirds probability and out comes a, and then you have a solution. So verifying that stuff would be really big because it's a QMA complete, which means we can adapt that algorithm to match any other QMA problem. <clears throat> but the problem is that these are really difficult, really, really difficult. Um, many of these are many body interactions, which as you know, need approximations. They're not perfectly solvable. And uh, yeah, it gets really hairy really quickly, but th it's really cool to see this stuff. So again, this is how this is why it becomes interesting because eventually you want to get to the point where you're applying a restriction to your Hamiltonian and then that restriction gets you into BQP. Hmm? If you can apply a certain restriction to a Hamiltonian and gets you to BQP, you've just solved a problem on a quantum computer or you've just presented a problem that can be solved on a problem on a quantum computer. This is why we think Shor's algorithm is so easy to solve on a quantum computer. This is why we're convinced that the factoring is definitely something that you can do with a quantum computer is because it is BQP. Polynomial time, uh, or not polynomial time, excuse me, quantum dynamics, scattering amplitudes, things like that. That's stuff that you can solve on a quantum computer. So it is, Q, it is BQP complete. So the goal is going to be continue to add restrictions and see if you can get anything that is exactly solvable on a quantum computer and then becomes the new like algorithm that everybody's interested in. especially especially if it's this ground state stuff um very interesting things to think about uh again this is only the tip of the iceberg <laughs> very very quickly you start developing like these highly intense relationships between um, you know, quantum information passing through quantum computers and stuff of that nature that I talked about earlier. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it gets very, very hectic very quickly, but the goal is, of course, the goal is always to understand the hardness of the problem so that you can understand whether or not it's solvable and on what timeline it's solvable. Um, that's the goal. The, uh, I even had, I was talking a little bit about algorithms for, uh, you know, diagonalizing matrices, right? So I, I have an algorithm that will diagonalize a matrix. You diagonalize a Hamiltonian and you can get the ground state of it because you get the energy eigenvalues of it. And uh, what was I saying? Oh, I even had an algorithm that could diagonalize matrices. Um, but I think it was exponentially timed. It was based off of factoring. Um, but it wasn't factoring a number, it was factoring a polynomial, which I think made it exponential in time uh, and therefore not practical. Um, when it's exponential in time, it's fine, but like how does it go for, what happens if you, um, what happens if you try to, uh, yeah, what happens, so it's easy to do on a machine that you, if you want to do like 100 by 100, matrix, which is only like a chain of a hundred atoms, a one dimensional chain of a hundred atoms. And then you make this dynamical matrix and, uh, d that defines all the motion of these atoms and you get a hundred by hundred matrix that you can, that you want to diagonalize, <laughs> diagonalize, right? Diagonalize. Yeah. Then what happens, you know, that's, that's a pretty reasonable thing. A hundred by a hundred matrix. A lot of machines can do that in seconds. Um, probably even less than seconds. But then what happens if you wanted a realistic thing, like 100,000 atoms? Now you're gonna have a matrix that's a hundred, for a 1D chain, 100,000 by 100,000. If you wanna do, you know, multiple dimensions and it's even like erroneously longer, like way longer. I think it was three times, at least for my algorithm. If I wanted to do a, a one dimensional chain into three dimensions and it was for simple cubic. 
the more complicated the structure was, the, the harder it was. So try to do a 300,000 by 300,000 matrix diagonalized. <laughs> no dice on that one. And then you're still talking about like the smallest materials made. Ridiculous. <clears throat> Anyways, there we go, quantum complexity theory. <laughs> At least the very, very, very tip of the iceberg on quantum complexity theory. And that's still half an hour to explain it to you all. But um, that's what I've been learning about for the past couple weeks. I've been very interested in this. Um, <clears throat> also, you know, I kind of like, there's kind of like the whole thing about like, I want to know what goes on in the quantum computer inside. I think that's the, you know, that's the far too ambitious goal of any physicist is to know what's actually happening inside of the processes. And I think that like the complexity theory is an interesting thing because it will kind of give us some insight. I, I like to think it's kind of going to give us some insight on how much we can know. Um, <clears throat> but I don't know if it's true. I always feel like the, the complexity theory has the limitation that you always have to you're always limited by the questions that you're going to that you're currently asking. It's not at all like what's the word? All encompassing. Does that make sense? I wish uh Yeah. <clears throat> like for instance, if you want to know if there's a restriction that you can place on a 2K on a uh, on a 2K, on a two local Hamiltonian, you actually have to apply the restriction and then run the process of trying to prove whether or not it's it's BQP or if it's QMA. And to me, it's like you're putting one restriction on it. You know what I mean? It's like trying to figure out if, well, honestly, that's kind of how we solve problems, though. Do you guys ever feel like that? It's kind of how we solve problems. Like, if you want to put a, if you want to solve, like, a, a room temperature superconductor, what are you going to do? <laughs> you're going to try a bunch of materials at room temperature <laughs> under certain pressure constraints or whatnot, right? You just sort of change material. You're welcome, Phoebe. Thanks for sticking around. I'm glad. I'm glad you're here, and I hope that and I and I hope that other people find this interesting too. Yes, remember if you are just tuning in, or if you are watching the YouTube video or whatever, just hit you, you do the like thing. That helps. And subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. But I'm sure a lot of people have. That's why you're here. <laughs> um. <clears throat> but anyways, uh, I digress. Uh. Very interesting. But yeah, I suppose the best way to try, like, finding a superconductor at room temperature is to try a bunch of materials. Try to figure out restrictions that are going to make it work and then try that. So maybe this is the best way to do it. But I don't know. <clears throat> For anybody interested, here, I'll show you this too. This is one of these two local Hamiltonians where you start including spin too. Pew pew. Kind of interesting. It's QMA complete. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Wish there was more to it. <laughs> <clears throat> but oh well. All right. Next up, let's do a poll question. And then I don't think there's any questions. Does anyone have any questions? Anything. It doesn't even have to be about quantum complexity theory. You can ask me literally anything. <clears throat> For those of you who have not been here at the beginning or <clears throat> have left and come back, do you have any questions about anything? Let's see here. Da, 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 da. Rearranging this just a little bit more. Okay. There we go. Um, let's get back to here. Okay. The uh, other thing I want to do today was ask you a poll. So let's do a poll. I wonder if it will show up on the screen or just in chat. <clears throat> is it just yes or no? Oh no, I can write it in. Okay, 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 okay. Let's see here. I wonder if it's timed. Hmm. How do we know if it's timed? Should we do a test poll? I can add options, maybe. Ask community. All right, let's figure out if it's, if it's, where is it? Where's the poll? Oh, 
There it is. <sighs> oh, I can't vote in my own poll? So it's not, YouTube has, <laughs> yeah, I know, it's wild. Oh, there's this too. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Oh wait, can I vote? Oh no, it just allows me to close it and open it. That's kind of lame. <sighs> well, at least we know there's polls. Okay, we can end the poll now. And I get to choose, I get to manually end the poll. I like that. All right, so then let's run the poll. Here we go. Um, let's see, how do I want to phrase this? How about, how long will our current, wow, I did not spell current even close to correct. Current, how long will our current cosmological model last? Okay, is it gonna be forever? <laughs> um, let's do 50 years. Ooh, I should add greater than. Greater than 50 years. Greater than 25. How about 25 years? I'll just do 25, we'll just do ballparks. We'll just do ballparks, how's that sound? <clears throat> um, 10 years. Oh, I can only do four. Okay, we gotta cut some out. We'll cut out 25, we'll do 10. And then we'll do less than a year. Okay, here we go. We only do four, that's kind of sad. Okay, that's okay though, that's all right. So how long will our current cosmological model last? And I mean current cosmological matter, model as lambda CDM. Lambda being dark energy, CDM being cold dark matter. Now this is, includes everything, inflationary theory. Uh, what else is there? There's a lot of stuff in the current cosmological model. Let's kind of talk, let's look at some of the papers and go over it a little bit though. Um, I like this one, I think, by Michael Turner. Um, so let's go here. So if you want to wait before we <clears throat> do it. So remember the James Webb telescope is hopefully getting up in December and that should give us a lot of, in of insight, I think on the Hubble constant and the CMB and kind of like our cosmological model in general. Um, but let's go here and take a look at this abstract. Here we go, the abstract is really good. I like this abstract a lot. So the Lambda CDM cosmological model is remarkable. With just six parameters, it describes the evolution of the universe from an early, from a very early time when all structures were quantum fluctuations on subatomic scales to the present. And it's consistent with a wealth of high precision data, both laboratory measurements and astronomical observations. However, the foundation of Lambda CDM involves physics beyond the standard model of particle physics, particle dark matter, dark energy, uh, cosmic inflation. Until this new physics is clarified, Lambda CDM is at best incomplete and at worst a phenomenological construct that accommodates the data, which I feel like a lot of um, like cyclical, cyclical cosmology is, is, is just saying that, you know, that, that the, uh, that the cur current Lambda CDM is just, you know, accommodating data. Um, Let's see, I discussed the path forward, which involves both uh, discovery and disruption, some grand challenges, and finally limits of, of scientific cosmology. This one is like the overview paper. There's a couple more. Uh, <clears throat> this one is from 2021, uh, which I thought was really interesting. A test of this. someone from my group shared this with me. Um, we study the large scale in anisotropy anisotropy of the universe by measuring the dipole of the angular distribution of a flux limited all sky sample of 1.36 million quasars. Wow. You imagine observed by the wide field infrared survey explorer. Of course, his name is wise. Um, this sample is derived from the new Catwise 2020 catalog. Uh, let's see here. Blah, 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 blah. 
While the direction of the dipole in the quasar sky is similar to that of the cosmic microwave background, its amplitude is over twice as large as expected. Rejecting the canonical, exclusively kinematic interpretation of the CMB dipole with a p-value of 5 times 10 to the negative 7, which is a 4.9 sigma effect. The highest significance achieved to date in such studies are results are in conflict with the cosmological principle, a foundational assumption of the coordinates of the Lambda CDM. Very, very interesting. Now this, again, this like Hubble constant and the Lambda CDM and inflation, all that stuff, this has been under fire. This is a constant, a battleground for the past couple of years. I wanna say at least two years. It's really gotten like a lot of traction. Um, I think cosmology is wonderful field if you're interested in studying right now because I feel like the next like five years are gonna be monumental for this field. Uh, especially with things like James Webb launching and these more and more of these things going out. I mean, there's even people challenging the, um, the assumption of the acceleration of the universe, saying that while the universe is accelerating, uh, that it's not uniform. It's not a uniform acceleration, which is a wild assumption to make. Uh, saying that it's not ho homogenous. Right? Is that the right word? Homogenous? Yeah. Pretty crazy stuff. So what do you guys think? You guys are, are you voted, but you didn't talk. What, how do we, we only have, we have six votes. So let me know. A lot of people are saying 50 years and some people are saying 10 years. So why? Why are you, why do you think that it will last for 50 years, but not forever? Or why do you think that, like, what will change in 50 years? Our understanding. So somewhere between 10 to 50, but closer to 50. And some people are saying somewhere between, you know, 1 and 50, but closer to 10. Um, I think, personally, I think it's around the 10-year mark. I don't think our current cosmological model will last forever. I don't think Lambda, I just, I, I, I think that it's too... Now you have to remember, I don't study this anymore. I studied it for a little while, but I don't study it anymore. And I think that the current, <laughs> Alan says some smart dude is going to be born and then needs a buffer for education. <laughs> um, yeah, I, he needs that much time to get through his education so that he can <laughs> figure out that Lambda CDM is wrong. Um, new data coming in and more study of fundamental particles. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, or do that, definitely. Um, yeah, like the uh, dark matter is obviously one of those things where like cold dark matter has been in favor and then fell out of favor and then back in favor and then out of favor. And now it seems that like, you know, we don't know anymore, right? Like there's, it's so much harder to tell what dark matter is now because we've been looking at it for so long and we're just not sure. Um, it's pretty evident that it's a particle. There's no reason to think otherwise. There's a little bit of hope in a, a, I don't want to say modified gravity, but I would say something like, um, a, let's see, what, how do I want to describe it? I want to make sure it's very separate from modified gravity. Uh, I don't think modified gravity is realistic. And I think people that use modified gravity are using it too loosely. I think what people mean is a more precise dynamical approach to gravity. Because um, obviously gravity is not wrong. Like Einstein, you can put, I mean, Einstein's been a test after test after test, it's right. So Einstein's not wrong with gravity, but it's possible that there's precision dynamics going on that we don't understand at large scales. Um, and I look forward to places like Eric Verlinde or people like Eric Verlinde and others who are working on traffic and tropic gravity. I think that that is pretty much the last effort to prove that it's not particles. Um, at least the last effort that's on the table right now. It's very convincing that that's possible. Um, but again, this is not modifying. It's more precise measurements of gravity that would say we don't necessarily need a particle, but the, things like that require there. It's a giant uphill battle right now so pretty much particle is winning particle is probably just the way that we need to focus the attention on for now until someone else has a more until either the people who are working on entropic gravity show us some some really inarguable data or particles or someone comes up with a different better idea um but for now particles the way to go and then so then what do you do well there's a bunch of different classes of particles to talk about 
<clears throat> it's like, I don't, like, cold dark matter seems like the most intuitive one. I mean, like, how do you have hot dark matter that's not radiating photons? <laughs> Radiates photons, it's not dark anymore. Um, really, really, you know, so cold dark matter just seems like it fits. So good. I don't know. Uh, oh, we changed the tides around. Now we're on 10 years. Uh, I think that the rate at which we gather data, <laughs> and now there's a tie. <laughs> uh, I think the rate at which we can gather data about the universe will only get faster and our ability to get data we haven't thought about yet will eventually mean the model won't last long. Yeah, I think that's the, a very good way to say uh, what I think, Noah, too. Um, hey, NC! Good to see you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, so this is a paper that I that came out earlier primordial. That I think it's kind of interesting um, This one actually strengthens the Hubble constant into uh, A parameter I don't know Let's just look at it primordial magnetic fields can change the recombination history of the universe by inducing Clumping in the baryon density at small scales. Uh, they were recently proposed as a candidate model to relieve Hubble tension um, This is interesting Relieving Hubble tension by including magnetic effects is a very interesting idea to me. And I'm glad we have very smart people working on it. Um, I looked a little into Sylvia. She seems brilliant, um, but I don't know enough about her. Um, but yeah, I, I would say th this is a, an interesting, uh, uh, certainly an interesting endeavor. Uh, and hopefully they get some really good stuff. But including magnetic effects to actually relieve the Hubble tension is something that I've never really thought about. But this paper, I'll link this one if you're interested in that stuff. I kind of will probably try to read this paper before Wednesday when I actually start talking to... Um, yeah, that's that's this one. I'll probably try to read this one before I go to that talk. Because if he's going to talk... If, the, if uh, John Turney is going to talk about... Uh, Jeez, get out of here. If John Turney is going to talk about uh, magnetic monopoles, then I'll want to uh, see that, I think. <clears throat> um, <laughs> trust NC to have consistent across platforms. Definitely. I do. Um, oh, somebody asked me what Physics OH stood for at the beginning. Amber, I think, might have asked. I don't know if you're still here, Amber, or not. Uh, but it's Physics Office Hours. Yeah, it's designed as like an office hours to help teach people physics, that's all. <clears throat> um, okay, so the tie is between 50 and 10 years with someone saying less than a year, which I, I think that's, I think less than a year is possible. Is every, I think, <laughs> I'm all about that consistency. Uh, but yeah, so this paper is written just, let's go back to the other, the first one, because there's this section four. Section four is really cool. Section four has everything that someone like me wants to know. without getting too invested. Wait, some grand challenges beyond Lambda CDM. I don't know what that was. I think that was a, either, I hope that wasn't a B. <laughs> um, so the revolution in cosmology is initiated by bringing in ideas from particle physics began in baryogenesis. I think baryogenesis is one of the, I don't know why. So this is a question for like someone like Dylan Berger. What, what's the difference between baryogenesis and leptogenesis? Are they actually both? Okay, so the, I mean, obviously one's for baryons, one's for leptons, but are they both events that definitely happened? And did it go, like, did they happen at the same time? Did baryons happen first? Did leptons happen first? Wouldn't leptons happen first and then baryons? Oh no, baryons are quarks. So baryons probably would happen first and then leptons? I don't know. I don't know. What's leptogenesis and baryon genesis? I just, anyways. Um, ahem. So, <laughs> baryogenesis is one of the grand challenges beyond land CDM. Uh, and yeah, back when this was about providing office hours, now we just have game shows. <laughs> so, bring back the questions on how to solve analytically, solve for the roots of a quintic polynomial. That was fun. I remember that day. That was fun. Um, yeah, I remember one of the first streams was, um, who was it? It was, uh, he's not with us anymore. I haven't, I haven't seen him in a long time. R RPG, RPG, remember RPG? Asked me about, um, 
Relativistic kinematics. That was like one of the first questions I got when streaming. <laughs> I tried. Oh, I tried. It was so hard though. It was such a hard question. Uh, if you're just watching and you want to tune in on a poll, we have a poll live. Um, you're just listening, I should say. We have a poll live in the chat right now. How long will our current cosmological lot model last? Uh, we have forever, about 50 years, about 10 years, or less than a year. And we have um, the majority right now is in 10 years, about 10 years, uh, with followed closely by 50 years. So probably somewhere in the middle of that is what people are thinking. And then uh, we have one vote in less than a year and zero votes in forever. Um, which means that we're all in it that Lambda CDM is not ultimately correct. And it's really a technological question about how fast we can get more data or come up with new ideas. Um, but I mean, Lambda CDM has done a lot of stuff for us. Let's not get wrong with that. Lambda CDM has a lot of good things. Um, I mean, like the flatness problem is one of the most convincing things for me, uh, is we have the flatness problem relatively solved. Whoever <laughs> said less than a year, do you know something we don't? <laughs> Maybe it's someone who's really invested with James Webb gi giving us like wild data. Um, that'd be that'd be funny. Uh, but the flatness problem is one of the things that like I found to be the most convincing, and that is that the universe is locally flat um, to some like very 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 large degree. And in order to get that flatness, then upon the you know the big bang then we would have had to if it if it progressed at like a constant rate we would have had to like it was some ridiculous percentage of like making it work like some like absolutely ridiculously low percentage i think there was like a bunch of zeros and then like 15 percent so it was like 0. 0.00015 or something like that Percent. It was like ridiculously low. Okay, so just go off of that. Wildly low. <laughs> Someone equated it to standing a pencil, a sharpened pencil on its tip. That was what someone equated the. I think it was Barbara Ryden in this excellent, excellent book that's made for people who are not super invested, um, but want to learn some stuff in cosmology. Um, <clears throat> yeah, is it equated it to standing a pencil on a sharpened tip? That's how likely you are that the universe would appear flat if it progressed at a constant rate. So one way to solve that was inflation. But you get weird things like inflatons, things like that. And I don't know what they even mean. And apparently now we're having some, some, spicy, some spicy conversations about this. It's a great book, Pedro. I love that book. Um, so then the next thing is, so we have baryogenesis. Let's see, let's... Uh, <clears throat> okay, so Electro Week Baryogenesis once looked promising, but appears to fail on two accounts. Not enough CP violation, which means we don't, you know, obviously there's like the, um, we need CP violation because we don't have, CP will take a particle to an antiparticle and vice versa. And we don't have that, obviously. We don't have that symmetry between particles and antiparticles. Um, particles and antiparticles will annihilate if they come together. We're still here. <laughs> we have not all annihilated to nothing. So... So there's more particles than antiparticles. That's about as clear as I can make it, is doing a lot of this. <laughs> um, so yeah, so there's not enough CP violation in the standard model, and the dynamics of the phase transitions do not provide the requisite departure from equilibrium, which is what we're at. We're not at equilibrium with, with particles and antiparticles. Um, oh, so here we go. So currently much tension is focused on leptobaryogenesis, where a lepton asymmetry is produced early on, and then fit, transformed into a baryon asymmetry by B plus L violating electroweak. There we go. That was the quest. That answers the question I had earlier. Interesting to just read things. Um, in either case, it appears that baryogenesis involves physics at scales that are inaccessible in the laboratory, uh, making progress difficult to test. Yeah, we can't make a new leptogenesis and baryogenesis. Um, that's a hard thing to do. Um, all right, so who ordered that? I got more Minecraft achievement, looks like. Punch a tree until a block of wood pops out. So I'm getting Minecraft achievements by streaming to you. I, I hope you guys know that. Did you guys see that pop up? Did you not? Did you see that achievement? It didn't look like it showed up. I wonder if I'm using screen capture or I am using screen capture, display capture. Interesting. 
Um, so the history of cosmology is growing complexity in the composition of the universe, baryons, photons, neutrinos, exotic dark matter, and cold dark matter, massive neutrinos, and dark energy. Ravi's words, who ordered all that? Are there more relics? What's next? The cosmic mix raises interesting question raises interesting questions about why is the ratio of CDM to baryons about five? Odd. Um, and the ratio of baryons to neutrinos about ten. Uh, both ratios are of course constant in time. I think that's a weird thing. That might just be me. I might be the only one who thinks that's weird. But I think that's weird. So it's interesting. Yeah, we have a very and then like you know. Anthropo anthropological argument. That's the way it is because that's the only way it could be. Um, but I mean, that's not satisfying to me and a lot of other people. Uh, my question on that. <laughs> see, I know. I can make commands. I just haven't yet. We have a couple commands. Um, like quote, but I don't have any quotes. So it just re. re yeah, we just re, re. I just get that back. Oops, Commando. <clears throat> it's a work in progress. I don't know if that will return anything either. Doesn't look like it. Anyways, um, inflation up or out? Let's talk about that. Uh, inflation has moved cosmology forward for more than three decades, but is a complete is an incomplete theory and has teased us. Oh look, it did show up. It was just very late. Um. <clears throat> but it is an incomplete theory and has teased us with some very big ideas. The multiverse, the grand challenge is simple. E.g. Oh, e.g. The, the multiverse. The grand challenge is simple. A fundamental theory that makes sharp predictions that can be falsified. Or even a better theory to replace it. Very interesting. Making sense of the multiverse. I think this is the hardest part. Um, yeah. I think this is the hardest part. It's how do you make sense of the multiverse. If you want an inflationary theory, then I don't want to say that you have to subscribe to anthropological stuff because I just don't think anybody has to ever. Um, <laughs> but like there's a lot of questions that the inflationary theory rises. Like what's an infloton? Um, I think that's kind of like the biggest one. And like how do we ever find it or prove that it's there? Are there any signatures that it gives off or anything? Um, very difficult thing to answer, but um, anyways, very interesting stuff. Uh, my question on that, just because I'm not familiar with the details, shouldn't we expect the universe to be locally flat because we modeled it by a pseudo Ramanian manifold? No, I don't think we ever model anything because of expectations. Like we didn't define flat to be what we see. Oh. Okay, so we have to think about this in the micro and the macro sense, right? Like, we have a flatness that we can define locally. Like, we have a flatness on Earth, too. So, like, we know that the flatness that we have locally on Earth, not that the Earth is flat, but locally, the Earth looks flat, people. People. Um, don't. Uh, but, like, locally, if you look at, like, over a field, it looks flat, right? And that's the analogy that's commonly used. So I think even if we describe flatness as something that we like by definition named flat things, then um, then we still don't know what that means globally, right? Like with the earth, we know that it's locally flat because we can see it, but then when we go outside, we realize that it's actually not flat, right? The earth is not flat, everybody, please. <laughs> like the earth, no, no. <laughs> I didn't mean it like that. Um, <laughs> so, right. When you go outside the earth, you realize it's not flat and that, uh, and that we've defined that flatness to be the same, I think. Yeah. So then we say, okay, so the, that flatness is the same. So then we can define curve based off of that and then we can keep going. So we've defined flat, yes. And then we define a Riemannian manifold to be, or a pseudo Riemannian manifold, sure. Uh, uh, you know, yeah, anyways. And uh, 
but we still have we still have the uh, the difference modeled between flat and, and curved so now the question is non locally what's the universe look like okay we're good we're back we're back it's good the universe can be curved <laughs> okay 15 votes and we have the majority of people voted for 10 around 10 years i agree so it's really 16 votes but youtube won't let me vote on my own poll that's not very nice what if i was the only person in chat then i would want to vote on my own poll so that makes me sad but we can ignore that fact <clears throat> Um, yeah, we can ignore that fact. <laughs> uh, it does look like someone sent me a tip. So thank you very much for that. Whoever did that, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. That was awful thoughtful. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know why I didn't get a notification here, but nevertheless, I do appreciate it. So thank you. Um, uh, anyways, the, uh, where was I going with this? I don't know. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, YouTube. <laughs> I wish I could vote in my own poll. But we'll end the poll at 15 votes. That's very good. I agree. I think 10 years. I think 10 years is where we're looking at for replacing Lambda CDM with something more in tune. Do you think, which part do you think is going to make it? I think CDM will make it. But I might be a little bit. I mean, I studied cold dark matter for a while. <laughs> so I might be a little bit biased. But I do think cold dark matter is going to make it. Um... But I also, I also don't know what it looks like. No idea what it looks like. But nevertheless, it's still going to be fun. Um, so what should we do now? I wanted to do GRE Marbles, but that's out of the game. We could play Archive versus Snarchive for a little bit. You guys want to play Archive versus Snarchive? Um, last time we tried this, we just played together. And that was fun. So I am totally down with that again. <clears throat> I'm down with that. Let's play Archive versus Snarchive together. <laughs> I can see this chat. Whoa. This chat. It doesn't have click maps. So you're just going to have to tell me left or right. L's or R's in chat. That's all I can accept, unfortunately. I wish it had click maps, but it doesn't. Maybe I could just Google it. Hold on. Let's Google it together. One of the things I've taught you on since we've started streaming is Googling things. Look it, it won't let me do BTTV on my YouTube, it's beta. What do I have to do to do this? Do I have to email them or something? How come I didn't get on this? I didn't get in on this, and that makes me sad. <clears throat> um, let's just check click maps for YouTube, but I'm assuming no dice. No dice. Click tips. Oh, no. Okay, let's just do this one. <laughs> so you guys will have to just put in chat L's or R's if you think it's left or right. Um, this is left and this is right, I'm presuming for everybody. I don't think YouTube mirrors, the, mirrors it or anything. Wait, I can actually look at that. No, it doesn't mirror it. Yeah, it does not mirror it. Okay, we good. Okay, so do you think... <clears throat> Is Snarkive like Vixra? <laughs> no. So Vixra, if you don't know what Vixra is, Vixra is an open uh, archive that anybody can admit that anybody can admit papers to. Um, so you don't have to be an academic. Uh, archive requires a few things. Archive now requires someone to at least look at your paper, I think, before it goes through. Um, but you also have to be an academic. Um, but the person looking at archive. Uh, the person who looks at your paper, it might be a computer. It might be a machine. I don't know if it's a machine or a person. My old advisor used to tell me that it was a person um, because of an because he got like a reply from it or something. Uh, he had to change something about format and he got a reply from somebody. But I don't know if it's a computer like processed thing or if it's a real thing. But ideally, the problem that they had with his paper is it didn't fit into a good category. So he had to change the categories from what he wanted. Um... But anyways, regardless, Archive is like a place where academics can go and submit papers and you have to have like a reference and an email from a university and that's it. That's all you need to submit. Um, and then Vixra is like an open. Anybody can submit anything, anytime. Um, now Snarkive is a an AI that will, I think it's AI or yeah, an a, we'll just call it AI. 
for the sake of me not knowing what the term is. Um, where it will pull various words from all over archive and formulate a title with them. And the goal with this is, can you guess which title is from archive and which one is from snarkive? So the goal is you want to click the one from archive. So the snarkive is just a machine, a machine learn or yeah, just a machine generated title. Yeah, it's completely fake. Uh, <clears throat> so the two titles that we're looking at are 2HDMC, 2 Higgs Doublet Model Calculator versus a Mathematical School Lectures on Endpoint Correlations. I don't think, now this is why I think Snarkive made a mistake here. I don't think you would put the abbreviation in the title. So NC says the right. I agree. I think Mathematica School Lectures on Endpoint Correlators sounds very realistic to me. Because usually like Archive is a good place to just put like lecture notes or stuff like that. Things that you're not going to necessarily publish in a literature journal, but that would be very beneficial to someone to have on an open site that anybody can go and download. L seems to be contrarian. I don't know what contrarian means. I knew at one point. I don't remember what that means. <laughs> what does contrarian mean? Like, like, I keep thinking of contradiction. Now we have people saying left, but what, I don't know why an abbreviation would go into a title. I think that's the, oh, L to be contrarian. You want to be contrarian. A person who opposes or rejects your popular opinion. There it is. Gotcha. Contrarian. So you want to go L, but then all of a sudden everybody made L the more popular vote. Freeman Dyson is a contrarian. Yes. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, especially with things like climate change, um, which I disagree with him on. I pre think pretty much everybody disagrees with him on. Um, he made some good points with climate change. It was nice to have like a, a voice like his like loud about climate change. Which is basically like, but I think he was wrong. Um, he was basically like, it won't matter, it won't amount to anything. Um, but I think it was just really foolish of him to say that. Um, but so we have three people for the left and two people for the right. I'm also for the right, so we're tied. We need a tiebreaker. The next person to say L or R that hasn't already cast their vote, we're going with you. We're gonna, we're gonna take it. We're gonna take it to victory. I think R. We have three R's and three L's. We need a tiebreaker. Someone save us. There it is. We're going R. Pedro's got us. Guys, would you count to vote again? <gasps> what? What? This manual describes the public code 2HDMC? Okay, so firstly, if I even read this abstract, I would think it was machine generated. What? The program features simple conversion between different parameterizations of the 2HDM potential, a flexible Yukawa sector specif specification with choices of different Z2 symmetries or more general couplings. Okay, okay, that's all fine and dandy. All two body and some three body decay modes for the Higgs boson and the possibly to calculate observables of interest constraining the 2HDM parameter space as well as theoretical constraints for positive and unitarity. Yeah, the latest version of the 2HDMC code. It doesn't even sound, it doesn't sound like a real thing. That's wild, okay. All right, I don't know. I don't get it. Whatever. Hey, look at that, we're back to Z, oh, we already. <laughs> <laughs> do i dare <laughs> all right next one hit me with your l's and your r's what do we got progress in collapsing black holes during inflation versus covariant classification of qq 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 more bra uh bar meson systems and existence of new scalar and axial vector mesons hmm or mesons if you want to Try to be contrarian, right, Alan? Yeah. 
Uh, progress in collapsing black holes during inflation. Co covariant classification of QQ bar meson systems and the existence of new scalar and axial vector mesons. That's a big one. Um, collapsing black holes during inflation doesn't even sound real. But, like, that also makes me think that someone would probably do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it just doesn't even sound realistic. R because it has big words. <laughs> so we have three R and two L. I'm torn. The left one just seems wrong to me. Progress in collapsing black holes during inflation? What are you, like, exp <laughs> L, oh no, you're making us tied again, Pedro. Now I have to be the tiebreaker. Um, oh man, covariant classifications of QQ more, bar, bar meson systems, uh, an existence of new scalar and axial vector, vector, vector mesons. Oh man. Anybody else want to break the tie? Oh, we have a we have a tiebreaker. We're going to go R. Okay, I was actually kind of leaning R too. This one just sounds fake to me. But like I said, that could mean it's real. No, it's not real. <laughs> Look at this paper, an instanton. What? Why? What have you done? Just an instanton. Here, I got to switch mics back. I keep for I forgot to do that. Hold on. There we go. Now I sound more professional. Look at this paper. An instaton. An instaton versus non-local effects in high energy charged particle beams. We have to get a much better score. So we have L for sure, L and R. I would have titled it just an insta instaton, right? Why? Why an instaton like that? Who wouldn't name a paper an instaton if they could? Like, come on. Drop the and just instaton. <laughs> I don't even know. This is crazy. What type of paper is that? I feel like okay. So what are we at? We have two L's and two R's. I feel like it has to be R. Non-local effects in high-energy charged particle beams. Let's think here. So the PP, the PP collider, is definitely. A charged particle beam but I don't know if anybody would call it a charged particle beam well sure if they're talking about just any generic particle charged beam because then the EE collider is too so maybe you just want like a generic paper on a charged card particle collider so you talk about the non-local effects of high energy charged particle beams that totally seems legit to me I'm on the R team so we have two L's five r's we're going with r i want to go with r here we go okay good 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 i'm so glad an instaton is not a paper wait why does it say ow dyson <laughs> oh <laughs> they put fake authors Wait, do they put fake authors on the fake papers? What happens if you click it? What? All the Snarkive papers are by famous physicists? Who is that then? Are you sure they're not fake physicists? Let's see here. Ah, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. You'll get Rickrolled. I know, eventually I will get. Okay, here we go. Let's get back to it. SU2 Yang Mills Thermodynamics and Photon Physics. That sounds legit. Versus Jerusalem Lectures on anal Analyticity. In spin in effective models. I have no idea. Jerusalem model lectures on an analyticity in spin and effective models. I think that sounds fake. <laughs> I have a new mission in life to write paper called an instanton. <laughs> I think doctor's right. I think it's L. I do. I think it's the left one. 
I don't see how, like Jerusalem lectures make sense to me. Analyticity, okay. Spin in effective models? It just seems so like, I don't know. Also, analyticity of spin in effective models. Oh man. Wow, everybody says L. Yeah, I like the right one just doesn't sound right to me. All right. Watch us be wrong, everybody. Okay, we're good. Whew. <laughs> All right, we're first year graduate student. We can get up to something higher. I don't know what the names are. Um, okay, asymptotics. Remember we got 10 for 10 that one time, everybody? That was amazing. Asymptotics and pre-asymptotics at small x versus the Hilbert space and non-trivial hyper-collar. Collar, 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 hyper-collar, quotients. Okay, so as asymptotics and pre-asymptotics at small x. <laughs> All right, now we're on to this next one. I think we're on ours. I don't think Steve, I think Steve, you, you voted L for the last one. I think we're on, okay, so now we're on some R's. Um, Hilbert space and non-trivial hypercollar quotients sounds realistic because I realized if I try to doubt names, I'm probably wrong. So if I try to say like, oh, that name doesn't sound right. Usually that means I'm wrong. And this looks like a totally legitimate name. Collar. So whatever hyper collar are. Unless collar is a thing, and then I don't know. But I just assume it's a name, and then I don't know what the name is. So we have three R's and nothing else. Are we just confidently going with R on this one? I don't know. L, asym asymptotics, and pre-asymptotics, that small s, X? I don't know what that means. What's a pre-asymptotic? Who's the math whiz in here who can tell me what a pre-asymptotic is? I choose R because they capitalize the X. <laughs> we will not capitalize small X's. Stuff before the asymptote, right? That's what I thought. But what does it mean to be pre-asymptotic at X? And why is it both asymptotic and pre-asymptotic at X? These are the questions we have to ask. And you know that it got hypercollar from somewhere. So it's probably on archive somewhere. All right, I think we're gonna go with R. What do we have? We have R, 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 L, L, R. Okay, so we're going R. And Steven has R too, so we're going R. Here we go, ready? <sighs> wow. Wow, 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 wow. And it's by Salam! Is it the same Salam? No way. No. Okay. Okay, no, it's definitely not him. <laughs> Oh, they wrote it wrong. It's a clone. No, it's not the Salam that, that also developed QCD. Although this Salam works on QCD. That's crazy. Are they related? Are you going to stop that? Abdus Salam. Nobel Prize winning laureate for particle physics. Does he have kids? Children, six. Who are they? Yo, can you imagine if he was popping a kid out at the same time that he was writing QCD though, dude? Oh, he wasn't QCD. He was, um, oh, I'm mixing it up. He wasn't QCD. He was the standard model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was the standard model with uh, with uh, Steven Weinberg, although they did it independently. So again, imagine popping a kid out while you're writing the standard model. Hmm? 
pretty wild, if you ask me. Sitting in the hospital. He was with Weinberg. He was not with Weinberg. They did it independently. Uh, Salam was a hair later than Weinberg. Weinberg got to it like a few months ahead. <clears throat> but they were at the same time. It was at the same time. It was like Salam's paper went out in the in I think it was January of the year after Weinberg's went out. Weinberg's went out in like October, November, and then Salam's went out in January. And I heard that they bickered about it like <laughs> for many, many years. Um <clears throat> yeah, I heard he, they bickered about it for many years. It's kind of funny. Uh anyways, let's get back to the game. But we lost that. We're back to an undergraduate. We can get better. Okay, classifying instatons. Here we go again with the instatons. Pedro, I know. I don't get it. Classifying instatons. The reduction of N equals M supergravity with vanishing deformation versus loop-induced flavor-changing neutral decays of the top cork and two, a general tooth Higgs doublet model. So what do you what do you think it is? We got two bunches of word salad there, left or right, L's or R's. Classifying instantons, the reduction of N equals M supergravity with a vanishing deformation. I don't think that's right. Loop induced flavor changing neutral decays of the top cork and a general two Higgs doublet model. That sounds completely legit to me. No idea about the left one though. Classifying instatons, the reduction of n equals m super gravity? Both sound equally legit to you. Well, the left one is definitely better than some of the other ones that we've gotten. Like an instaton. <laughs> um, instatons have tried to get us once already. <laughs> Let's not fall for it. I feel like, well, we didn't get got. We didn't get got by the early instatons. We got that one right. By C. Witten. These are fake names. F. E. Schwinger. <laughs> B. Poincaré. Oh, my goodness. And they went hard on the names. Look at M. Polchinski. F. Polchinski. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's hilarious. These names, they're so oh goodness, that is good. I it's an archive, you got me. That made me laugh really hard. Um <clears throat> So we're R's on this, are we? Are we? L looks legit to you. I think I'm gonna go with R on this. I think I <laughs> Yeah, I'm a grad and I'm supposed to know these things, but this is also a game, so I shouldn't. We shouldn't take this too hard. <laughs> Let's do loop-induced flavor changing. I think we're gonna go with R. Here we go. Boom. We're back to. Okay, we're still undergraduate. Makes me a little sad. Okay, let's keep going. Ori <laughs> Orientifold planes at the weak scale on a probe of generalizing effect of unparticle physics. <laughs> Effective unparticle physics versus gluonic magnetic sus susceptibilities of the QCD vacuum. I don't know what effective unparticle physics are, but I feel like I'm going to have to look at that paper after if it's real. Oriental fold planes at the weak scale. I feel like I have to go with R because I don't want to believe in unparticle physics. Like every part in my body does not want unparticle physics to be a thing. <laughs> I just don't want unparticle physics to be real. Um, but then again, I feel like it had to pull it from somewhere unless it did a word combination and it just grabbed un from something and just particle and then just made unparticle. I don't want unparticle to be a thing. Oh, man. Okay, we have three R's. Does anybody think L could be correct? Maybe I'm going about this the wrong way. Maybe I need to pick left because of effective unparticles. If unparticle physics were a thing, we'd have flying cars. By <laughs> That's only if there's an ungraviton. Mandry, <laughs> man, you troll me enough to know I don't know if I trust that. <laughs> um, I don't know. Let's go with R. 
That was just for fun. <laughs> Let's go with R. Okay, thank goodness. We do have to look it up. Oh, it's a thing. <laughs> it's from George Eye! Are you serious? That is the George Eye. How are George I? He's written a bunch of textbooks and stuff, I think. Harvard, yeah. No way! What books did he write? He wrote a few, like, really, really good books. I have this one. It must be at my desk, on my office. <laughs> also known as unright. Unparticle physics is just someone who really into the fact that particles are really oscillations in different quantum fields. Let's let's look at it. This is crazy. And it's from such a like a renowned physicist. Okay. I love his books too. His book was like that book right here, Weak Interactions and Modern Particle Physics was really uh was I used that quite a bit for a while. I don't know how much it stands up anymore. Um but I used it. I liked it. Uh, so what is unparticle physics? I discussed some simple aspects of low energy physics of non-trivial scale invariant sector of an effective field theory. Okay. Uh, physics that can be, cannot be described in terms of particles. Oh, I see. Wow. I can't even begin to fathom what's in that. I can't even begin to fathom what's in that paper. Okay, <clears throat> let's keep going. We're at physics major. How do we go higher from, un oh, like we graduated. Okay, I get it. We graduated with a physics major. I got it. Okay, so non-vanishing T-dualities versus anomalies mist of ambiguities and the neutral pion decay. You knew someone didn't unparticle. People just have to. <laughs> they just have to. <laughs> I knew that the, the our Snarkive must have pulled it from somewhere. It's wild to me that this happened. Um. Anyways, we've t we've settled it. We've settled the unparticle business. <laughs> so non-vanishing t-duality versus anomalies. Left L's or R's? What do you think? We got an L. Non-vanishing t-dualities does sound good. Anomalies dismissed of ambiguities and the neutral pion decay. I fell into the trap of thinking that some composite particles can't decay before. But decay is not the same word. Or when I say composite, yeah, I meant fundamental particles so pion is made up of quarks yes but but you know the whole strong interactions and whatnot when it says decay it doesn't mean decay into into quarks it means decay into something else I'm trying to think of i was just thinking about that ambiguities of the neutral pion decay we got a lot of l's let's go l i think non-vanishing two dualities sounds good i think the knowledge dismissed of ambiguities that sounds fine to me too though but i also i don't know this one's such a toss-up all right we're gonna go into non-vanishing t duality because i think t stands for time ready That hurt. That hurt real good. Oh, it's by Bobbly Bobbly Bob. <laughs> We're back to undergraduate. This is not good. We're not having a good time. Two more. Let's do two more. Random tensors and broken Barosoro symmetric general relativity or from non commutative string membrane to ordinary ones. <laughs> I like the right title. I just like it. It just makes it feel like it's a paper for me. <laughs> From non-commutative -commut string slash membrane to ordinary ones. Although I don't think it's right. <laughs> I think left one sounds right. I Like you said, you got to bet on the names. <clears throat> 
I think I think L. Tell me what you think. The fact that this is written by you know, Bongubo still cracks me up. That was one of my favorite one of my favorite shorts to make or videos to make in general was the Bogliubov one. <clears throat> Where did my glasses go? I t I had to clean them. They just looked a little they looked a little dusty, that's all. <laughs> we have one L. One L, people, help me out here. I don't know. I think it's L. Am I going to have to just go with this doctor and I? That's it. Is the mask Bogliubov or the Bogliubov from chess? It's from the mask Bogliubov. Actually, it's from none, neither of them. It's made up. It's a made up Bogliubov. <laughs> they just slap a famous last name with a couple initials on it. Okay, we're gonna go L. <laughs> you don't like it if I didn't wear glasses? If this was me? What's wrong? I can't zoom in. Hold on. Hi. You know, one time I lost my glasses. Uh, one time I lost my glasses for, I think it was eight years. All right, let's go back. <laughs> Mandry, I feel like you're just going against me now. <laughs> oh, come on! <laughs> no! No! Oh, come on. That is, is that even a full sentence from non commutative string membrane to ordinary ones? So it's just, it's. What's the rest of the thing? Like, you have to finish the rest of the sentence. <laughs> Better than a monkey. <laughs> Wow, archive versus archive is harsh. Okay, let's do this. Last one. Progress in holographic duality in models of KK gravitons versus super embedding approach to M0 brain and multiple M0 brain systems. Wow, they went out on a hard one. Progress in holographic duality in models of KK gravitons versus super embedding approach to M0 brain versus multiple M0 brain systems. <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea what this could be. No clue. Oh my goodness. Anybody? L's or R's? Anybody? Left or right? Left or right? Doctor says right. Super may approach the M0 brain and multiple M0 brain system. So at least that one's... Oh man. They're both... At least these are both sentences. They both make sense in the sentence form. It's just bo all words I've never heard of. What's a KK Graviton? What? R is longer. Therefore. <laughs> um, super embedding approach to M0 brain and multiple M0 brain system. Also, it's missing an S though. Multiple M brain systems. Logic. It forgot the S. Therefore, it must be L. I have beaten the machine. But you guys all said R. <laughs> I feel like I need to go against y'all. I'm going to go against y'all and say L simply because they forgot the S. It's a trap. Even if it's a trap, I want to fall for it. Because <laughs> I think it's true. Doctor, don't do this to me. Don't do this to me. <sighs> Breathe. We got this. We can do it. I'm going against... I'm going to be... I'm going to be... I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. I'm going to be spicy. Oh. <laughs> uh, Look at the time. It's 3.30. <laughs> uh, as good as a monkey. <laughs> oh, no. That's too bad. 
<laughs> I am doing as good as a monkey. So there's always that. A monkey could guess that the KK Graviton was not a thing. Can we talk about the names on that paper, though? Because, I don't know, there's some pretty big names on that paper. Euler and Hawking and Dirac and Gelman and Schwartz and Schwinger. You tell me. You tell me what's the real paper. I don't know. Anyways, <laughs> I am going to wrap up the stream for today. This has been a fun stream. Thank you very much. Our thousand sub YouTube stream. Um, I'm going to play around with the VOD and see what I can do. See if I can cut it down so I can just have that one clip of the quantum complexity theory. Or if I actually have to take it into an editor and do it. I don't really know what's going to happen. Um... <clears throat> Which is a I did 29 out of 50 doing only, which is a longer title. Wow. So greater than 50%. As good as a monkey? Probably so. Maybe better than a monkey. <laughs> good to see you guys again as well. Dirac, Euler, Gelman, Gravitons. Definitely. Don't forget Schwartz, Schwinger, and Dirac too. <laughs> um, like I said, please join the Discord, which the, the, the link for that is in the description. Follow me on the socials and uh, keep touch when I do get back. Obviously, I will make all sorts of announcements. Um, <clears throat> like I said, I am feeling better, but I did start some different things that my body has to get adjusted to. And until it gets adjusted and I get kind of like my schedule all situated and whatnot, then until then I will continue to remain on break. Um, but I will also, you know, try to do random pop-up streams here and there. Um, follow the Twitch stream because we'll be back there next time. Probably at least a couple more streams on Twitch. Assuming I'm not switching, uh, we'll just go back there for good. And just do like, uh, that's also in the, the link for that's also in the description. Um... It's weird that I have a description with a live stream, but it kind of does make it easy. I was going to do the commands too, but then I was just like, it's in the description. Um, but maybe the commands are nice to have anyways, just because. So maybe I should just make those. I haven't decided yet. Either way, there will hopefully be more YouTube streams in the future, but the prim 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 primarily I will still remain on Twitch for now. Anyways, I hope you all have a great week. I hope you learned something today and we had a lot of fun doing it. Um, I'm, I know I did. Thank you again for the, uh, the tip. And if anybody would like to support the stream, there is information for that in the description. Um, that's there as well. Uh, but thank you again. And I will see you next time or on discord or on Twitter or somewhere. But until then, have fun, have a good time learning physics. Thank you for hanging out with me. Um, <clears throat> Take care, everybody. I don't know how to end this. Oh, there we go. <laughs> All right. Goodbye, everybody. Take care.